fall special town meeting. Would you take your seats, please? This means you. I acknowledge the affidavit of the town clerk relating to the proper publication and service of the warrant for this meeting and call on Dr. Slayton for the Star Spangled Banner. Please feel free to join me as you are able, and I will not take offense if you take a knee. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you. We settle down, please. Thank you. Uh, a few announcements to begin with, please. Silence your cell phones and uh, electronic devices, except for those of you who are following the proceedings on your cell phones. Can we have quiet, please? This meeting is in session. The seating procedures, as you know, are that the front row is reserved for town meeting members, speakers, and people with disabilities. The press first row on my right. I remind all speakers to announce your name and precinct as the first part of your presentation. And unless those of you, except for those of you who have cleared a greater time with me, the time limits for all of you are 15 minutes. Please remember to address questions to me, the moderator, when we come to the Q&A period. The Brookline food pantry donations can be made tomorrow evening by cash or check, not food, uh, in the uh, lobby outside the auditorium. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Moderator, John Margolis, Precinct 7. Uh, I rise to a point of order. Did the chair mean to say that the normal amount of time for speakers will be 15 minutes? I said five minutes, I believe. You, I, I believe cer you said 15. I certainly hope I did. I'm not going to change that rule. Okay, I'd like to briefly review the combined debates. We will have single debates on the following sets of warrant articles. Article 5 and Article 1 of the first special town meeting. Articles 6 through 8, Articles 10 through 14, Article 15 and Article 1 of the second special town meeting, and Articles 18 and 19. The order of the articles, uh, well, I have motions for the, to move the following articles to Wednesday evening. Uh, the first motion is to move Article 21 to be heard first thing Wednesday. That relates to the, the uh, honoring uh, our Brookline sculptor. Is there, a second, uh, is there a second to that motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 
Those opposed, no. The motion carries. Uh, there is a motion to move Article 20 to be heard as the second item of business tomorrow evening. Article 20 is the article relating to uh, the renaming or uh, co-naming of Columbus Day. Is there a second to that article? It's made by, motion is made by Ms. Connors. Second? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Motion carries. Artic and there's a motion to move articles 10 to 15 the, and uh, the art special, second special town meeting article, the articles relating to Hancock Village to be heard after we've completed our business with articles 20 and 21 and 20 tomorrow evening. And the reason for this is that uh, in the normal course of events, it was possible that we could reach Article 10 before uh, the end of this session, but without enough time to consider what is going to be a lengthy debate. So the motion has been made by Mr. Wyshynski to move the Hancock Village articles to be heard after 21 and 20 tomorrow evening. Those, uh, is there a second to that motion? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Motion carries. And finally, there is a motion for Mr. Feingold to move Article 9 from its normal place to be heard after we complete the Hancock Village articles Wednesday evening. And the purpose for that is uh, that otherwise his amendment, which was submitted too late, could not be heard. So is there a second to Mr. Feingold's motion? All those Mr. Moderator, point of order? Yes. Is, is this motion debatable or is it? Uh, yes. Okay, I wish to speak to the, uh, the motion to defer consideration of Article 9. Well, it's, it, it, the motion before you is a motion to move the consideration of Article 9 to Wednesday evening. Do you have something to say about that? I do, Mr. Moderator. Okay, say it. Uh, regrettably, I rise in opposition to the motion. Uh, I understand the desire of Mr. Feingold to have his amendment considered, but the amendment was filed after the amendment deadline, which was widely publicized, most recently in an email from the moderator to the entire listserv on October 31st. Beyond missing the relevant deadline, uh, I want to speak to my belief that delaying consideration of Article 9 would allow late filed amendments to be considered would be a, a bad precedent to set. Guiding uh, Brookline Town Meeting to orderly, timely, and clear decisions is difficult, not only because the, of the meeting size and the complexity and scale of the matters we must decide, but also because, frankly, we have a lot of lawyers and highly educated people in the room who will sniff out a loophole and a procedural gap. Delaying consideration of Article 9 tonight uh, would set a precedent that, in my view, endangers the orderly and predictable fashion in which the warrant articles have been considered by town meeting historically there have been higher, uh, that is, higher number of articles later in the warrant being considered later in the meeting. Take for an ex as an example uh, the order in which we would consider warrant articles this evening by delaying Article 9. Depending on the hour, uh, 9 and 10, uh, 10 through 14, as you just heard, uh, would have normally been taken up, but they've been moved to uh, Wednesday evening. Uh, therefore, According to the moderator, we'd likely proceed to Article 17, 18, and 19, and then to Article 22. Clearly, this would represent a deviation from the regular and predictable consideration of articles, and it is possible that the debate uh, could be ill-informed, given town meeting members and presenters a logical conclusion that their articles would not be uh, called upon at this early juncture. Again, uh, I rise in opposition to delaying consideration of Article 9 to tomorrow evening. On the other hand, Mr. Franco, if uh, the... Article 9 is delayed until tomorrow night. You have the amendment offered by Mr. Feingold. It was passed out tonight, and that would provide for the required 24 hours notice. On the motion to uh, delay Article 9 until Wednesday evening, those in, do you have a point, sir? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Joel Feingold, Precinct 1. I would merely like to point out that there are so many other things involved in this town meeting which are equally tardy and such a moving target that to single this one out seems to me unfair. Thank you. On the motion, uh, those in favor, please raise your hands. Those opposed? Well, 
Those in favor, please rise. Please stand if you're in favor of deferring consideration of Article 9 until tomorrow evening. Thank you. You may be seated. Those opposed, please stand. Uh, well, without a practice vote, we're going to have an electronic vote for the purpose of having an accurate count. I remind, uh, I remind you that, so this will serve as our practice vote, I guess, <coughs> although this is the real thing. Uh, when we start the timing, you will have 30 seconds. If, you're, uh, if you favor the motion to defer consideration of Article 9 until Wednesday evening, you will press 1, the number 1. If you are opposed, you press 2. And if you abstain, press 3. You can start the timing whenever you're ready. Uh, Mr. Marquardo advises me, our IT expert, that uh, he needs a couple of minutes to uh, fix the system. So we're going to move on. We'll come back to consideration of this motion uh, at when he's uh, fixed the system. Uh, I'd like to spend just a minute talking about uh, the deadline that uh, Mr. Feingold missed for the first night of town meeting. And there's been some suggestions from town meeting members that uh, we permit late filed amendments and other motions that miss the supplemental mailing to be distributed by uh, by over the uh, TMMA uh, list serve and so that I can have some means to evaluate that I'm inclined to not do that because uh, the 24-hour rule and the supplemental mailing rule has worked pretty well in the past. But I'd like to, uh, I've sent out a number of emails to town meeting members and they seem to be, have been received. I'd like to just have a uh, show of hands of those of you who believe that you're attentive to the emails that are sent over the listserv and who have received my instructional emails. So let me see a show of hands. Okay, and those of you who have not, are, don't pay attention to the listserv, well, <laughs> okay. I'll, uh, I'll take that into consideration and uh, give this some thought. It won't change our procedures for this town meeting. Mr. Moderator? Yes. Could I make a request? You can tell me your name first. Mariah Nobrega, Precinct 4. When, you're, when the technical um, expert is fixing the, the thing, is it possible to adjust the font? Because we can't read our names in the seats. Is it possible to make the font bigger? Because we can't tell which one of us or where we're I at. I think on we, the can, we can change the brightness from the uh, AV booth in the back. Can you increase the font size on the slide? Yeah, you just resize the slide. Thank you. Okay, I think we're ready to roll. So we're going to have a, an electronic vote on the motion to move consideration of Article 9 until Wednesday evening. All right, you'll have 40 seconds. 
and you can vote at any time. Well, so much for electronic voting. Uh, I'm going to have to swear in the tellers, and we'll have a uh, counted vote by the tellers in lieu of an electronic vote until we've fixed the system. So, uh, Mr. Bassett, are you here? Uh, Mr. Ross? Mr. Margolis, would you act as a teller? Uh, just stay seated until I line up six of you. Ms. Spiegel, Ms. Spiegel, are you here? Okay, and in in, you'll have the center. Uh, Mr. Dewart, uh, Mr. Gladstone, are you here? Mr. Vitolo, would you be a teller in the center? And uh, Mr. Olins. Okay, Ms. Kahn. Okay, now with the six people, Mr. Bassett, Mr. Margolis, Ms. Spiegel, Mr. Um, Mr. Vitolo, Mr. Olins, and Ms. Kahn, please rise. Raise your right hands. Do you swear that you will faithfully and impar impartially perform the duties of tellers of town meeting? Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, we will have a teller vote, which we haven't had for some years, so uh, this is likely to take a little while. Mr. Bassett and Mr. Margolis will count the votes on my left. Ms. Spiegel and Mr. Vitolo in the center, and Mr. Olins and Ms. Kahn on the right. Those in favor of moving Article 9 Consideration of Article 9 until Wednesday evening. Please stand and remain standing until your section is reported. Ms. Kahn? 19 in favor on the right. You may be seated on the right. My right. Ms. Spiegel? 30 in the middle. 30 in the center. You may be seated in the center. Thirty-five on the left. Please be seated, and if you oppose the motion, please stand. Remain standing until you've been counted, until your section has been counted, and I ask you to be seated.
is gone. 29 on the right. You may be seated on my right. Ms. Spiegel, 37 in the center. 23 on the left. 23 on the left. You may all be seated. Motion fails by a vote of 89 to 84. We will deal with Article 9 when we come to it this evening, if we get to it this evening. Um, I'm informed that there are uh, a couple of guests who are sitting in front of the forward of the checkers and uh, I'd appreciate it if you'd move to sit in the rear of the auditorium behind the checkers tables. Thank you. Okay, we proceed to Article 1. Uh, Article 1 deals with bills of prior fiscal year years there being no such bills before us moved by mr doggett seconded by ms hamilton for no action those in favor of no action on article one please say aye, aye. those opposed no motion carries article two again uh, article two relates to collective bargaining agreements there are none before us this evening so no action is moved by ms heller seconded by mr lynn jones those in favor of a no action vote on Article 2, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Article 3. The motion under Article 3 is on the Lavender Supplement relating to adjustments in the budget. You can see the adjustments summarized in the table and the Motion includes the appropriation of $340,000 for single tree tank improvements and $320,000 for single tree hill gatehouse improvements, both of which will be bonded so that this motion will require a two thirds vote. And finally, at the top of page three, an appropriation of $50,000 to implement traffic signal prioritizations on the Green line. That's moved by Mr. Green, seconded by Mr. Doggett. Mr. Green. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Bernard Green for the Board of Selectmen. Uh, on October 17, the Board of Selectmen held a public hearing after which the Board uh, voted favorable action on Article 3 uh, fiscal year 2018 budget amendments as then presented. Uh, the amendments allowed four items or addressed four items um, which we are also taking up again today or tonight. Um, but on October 31st, Article 3 came up for reconsideration by the board in order to consider a request by the MBTA to provide funding to implement traffic signal prioritization along the Green Line C branch. The May 2014 town meeting had appropriated $15,000 from the CIP to study transit signal prioritization and to price out its expansion along Beacon Street should the Transportation Board desire to expand it throughout the corridor. Since that time, the town has been working with the MBTA to create a transit signal prioritization communication system that could be used on any Green Line train without the need for substantial upgrading of equipment. 
The MBTA expanded, expended funds to develop their GPS communication system on all buses and trains, and this system uses the transit um, prioritization system uses uh, that technology. A test intersection was installed at Beacon Street and Carlton Street in May 2017, and a new traffic signal controller was installed, which the MBTA uh, paid for. Consultants have identified nine additional traffic signal locations along Beacon Street where traffic signal prioritization could be implemented at a total cost of $185,000. The town has been asked to convert the funding that we appropriated in 2014 to study implementation, uh, to study uh, this into uh, money to actually implement it, uh, covering 27% of the cost of the proposed Brookline project. The board supports this request and would like to reappropriate reappropriate the $50,000 in order to begin implementation. Therefore, a unanimous board on October 31st voted favorable action uh, on the motion to uh, make the amendments voted at the October 17 Board of Selectmen's meeting, uh, appropriate $340,000 for uh, single tree, tree tank improvements and to meet the appropriation authorized the treasurer with the approval of the selectmen to borrow $340,000 under Chapter 44 of the General Laws or any other enabling uh, authority, appropriate $320,000 for single tree hill gatehouse improvements uh, and to borrow $320,000 under General Laws Chapter 44 uh, or any other enabling uh, legislation and with respect to the MBTA, appropriate $50,000 <coughs> to implement traffic signal prioritization on the MBTA's green line and to meet the appropriation transfer uh, from the balance remaining in the appropriation voted under the 2014 uh, Warren article, which is Article 8, uh, Item 41. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to uh, adjourn the special town meeting temporarily to deal with the first of the special town meetings within the town meeting. Uh, and uh, we'll be come back to hear from Mr. Doggett in a moment. So I declare the uh, special town meeting adjourned and we convene the first special town meeting within the fall town meeting. Uh, there's one article, and I will take a motion to defer consideration of that article until we complete Article 5 on the main warrant. Somebody please make that motion. Is there a second? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. I adjourn the first special town meeting and reconvene the main special town meeting and call on Mr. Doggett under Article 3. Sorry for all these dreary mechanics, but... John Doggett, Precinct 13, and for the Advisory Committee. Good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> over the past year, the AC has raised the questions concerning the funding relating to the employment laws <coughs> The employment law claims that are currently part of the human resources budget and not in the legal department's budget, and therefore the responsibility of that department. The departments concerned have now agreed that the employment new claim, new law claims will be the responsibility of the legal department and recommend a $20,000 transfer from the human resource budget to the legal services budget. The AC is very satisfied by these arrangements. Um, just to say that $94,862 was the additional state aid that we received, and it's split 50-50 by the town school partnership, um, so that each party gets $47,431. <coughs> the town portion of the state aid, as well as $80,000 transfer from the town clerk's budget, totaling $127,431, is recommended to be added to the finance department budget. The 80000 in the town clerk's budget was to fund a special override election for earlier this year, which is now no longer planned, so the funds can be released. 
The Finance Department recommends that 127,000 uh, of the 127,000 uh, and so dollars, 25,000 be allocated to a consultant review of the MUNIS payroll system and the goal of improving, which, with the goal of improving profi, uh, prof processes and efficiency. The remaining $102,000 is destined for the uh, credit card service account. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, key, the reason here for the credit card service account transfer is that um, credit card service fees have increased dramatically in terms of uh, what we've experienced over the year, particularly uh, parking meters, for example. Uh, pay by sell parking meters have been extremely successful and consequently have imposed an additional burden on the credit card service fee account. The AC, the advisory committee <coughs> over the last few, two budget cycles has been concerned about the inconsistencies of the town's credit card fee recovery policies. For example, if the pay by phone is used, 17 cents recovered from the parking, is recovered from the parking user. However, if a credit card is used in the meter, no fee is recovered. The finance department will now be undertaking a review of the credit card fee payment recovery policies across all town services and hopes to implement a more consistent policy in the, next, in the upcoming budget year. Uh, I think uh, Selectman Green mentioned about the single tree improvements. Just to note here that that's an inf interest free loan from the MWRA, and the language which was omitted uh, allows for uh, the, a loan, that loan to be uh, taken up and will require the two thirds vote, as uh, the moderator has indicated. Uh, there is no budget increase as a consequence of this. This money has already been previously appropriated. The, on those items, the AC unanimously recommended in the first hearing a uh, favorable action on all of those items. Um, now to the transfer of the fund that I think uh, Slackman Green mentioned in some detail. So let me just add a few comments that uh, came up in the advisory committee. Um, <clears throat> it's for $50,000 uh, for this implementation of this transit signal prioritization technology on the uh, Beacon Street C line. <coughs> There was general agreement in the AC that this technology will shorten travel times for riders, although this is by no means high-speed rail, you should understand. Uh, it, it's about a minute per rider per, per trip is, would be saved. Uh, and, but, but basically, as one uh, uh, of our members described, on Beacon Street, for example, where a rider can see the trolleys coming down the tracks, many traffic lights up, it's very, very frustrating to see those cars stop and then they pick up passengers and then they stop and wait for the light to turn green. And then they stop and they, so it goes. And so at least we will get a very significant decrease in frustration, at least that is the hope when the system is implemented. Overall, the advisory committee was in favor of recommendation to fund the implementation of this technology on the, on the MBTA C line by a vote of 18 to 1 to 3, with three, abst sorry, with three abstentions. We recommend favorable action on Article 3. Thank you. On the motion on page two of the Lavender Supplement, those in favor, please uh, raise your hands. This is a two-thirds vote. Those opposed? Motion carries by a vote of 214 to one. Turn to Article 4, and the motion is on the TAN supplement, supplement number 1, that the move that the selectmen be authorized to acquire by purchase, gift, eminent domain, or otherwise, the land located at 111 Cypress Street, shown on the attached plan, and to finance the acquisition to borrow under Chapter 44 of the General Laws, the motion includes, goes over to page three of the Brown Supplement, and it includes the uh, map on page three. Moved by Mr. Wyshynski, seconded by Mr. Brown, also requires a two-thirds vote. Ms. Heller, you have seven minutes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Nancy Heller for a unanimous Board of Selectmen. Uh, at our annual meeting last spring, we approved moving forward with the BHS project by authorizing funds for further feasibility and schematics. The time we anticipated taking action to acquire the property at the corner of Cypress and Brinkton and use that property for BHS. That's the subject of this article. A brief recap of the history. Many in the community, neighbors, parents, residents, had expressed interest 
in the expansion of BHS and encourage the town to inquire to acquire 111 Cypress Street as far back as three or four years ago. As the BHS Expansion Advisory Committee began its work 14 months ago, we determined that we would explore the feasibility of expanding the facility on the current campus as likely the most prudent option. The initial part of the feasibility study looked at the difficulties and costs and of enrollment accommodations, science classroom improvements, and other programmatic issues. The initial conclusion was that we had three options. A minimum option, a little bitty bear, if you will, to accommodate the enrollment of 27 high school students. A moderate option, number two, to renovate for enrollment and also to meet current state standards, especially in science where we really are a substandard. And a maximum option of number three, to renovate so that we could accommodate all of our wish lists of teachers, recreation staff, etc. Um, the cost results of all three options were very surprising, and while committee members seemed to favor renovation with the mo moderate option number two, which addressed enrollment and the Mass Massachusetts state standards, we wondered whether there was a way to keep the cost down while not sacrificing the elements of the program that we need. The architects, with the support of the expansion committee, school committee, school staff, teachers, administrators, went back to the drawing boards to envision the construction of a standalone ninth grade academy, a building which would provide space for immediate enrollment relief and to envision less intrusive renovation at the main building to bring that facility, especially in science, up to snuff with current standards. The beauty of this revised plan, called Option 4, is that it is significantly more cost effective while meeting our needs to address enrollment in 21st century science facilities. Option 2 was projected to cost over $271 million dollars while option four is projected to cost, and, and these costs are not, not certain because we haven't finished the feasibility yet, but it, it's going to be at least $75 million less than that. So you can easily understand why we have pursued option four. Since last spring's town meeting, we acted on several fronts and are addressing several issues with, the, with this request. Through a committee of seven process, we selected the architectural firm of William Ron and Associates to provide schematic services and further feasibility, and project management firm of Hill International to assist in the very, very complex task of securing permission to construct part of the ninth grade academy over the MBTA tracks near the corner of Cyprus and Tappan. The Rowan architects have been hard at work meeting with school and recreation staff and teachers, working with the BHS Expansion Advisory Committee. The Hill project managers have also been hard at work coordinating efforts with the MBTA to secure air rights over the T. I believe I speak for the co-chairs of the BHS Expansion Advisory Committee as well as the other committee members, which include the superintendent and headmaster, when I say that we are very pleased with both of these firms' work to date. We've approached the current owner of 111 Cypress Street concerning a purchase and sale between the owner and the town, but have been unsuccessful in that regard. Therefore, we put this Article 4 before you tonight so the town meeting can authorize the Board of Selectmen to proceed with an eminent domain action. In preparation for this, we commissioned a professional appraisal for this purpose. An appraisal for eminent domain purposes specifies what the town would pay for the property called pro tanto payment based on the concept of highest and best use and involves significant research by the appraiser and comparisons with other similar properties. In this instance, the appraiser valued the highest and best use at $15.9 million. That is the amount that the town would pay pro tanto for the property. While the pro tanto payment represents the largest part of the authorization request before you, there are other costs associated with an eminent domain taking. As many of you know, the property is currently occupied by a tenant, an administrative office, files and computers, that means, of Brigham and Women's Physicians Organization. As part of the eminent domain action, we are required to provide some relocation assistance. In addition, we need to conduct environmental testing, which requires access to the building to look for asbestos and other contaminants, lead paint, evidence of oil spills, and other toxic substances such as mold. The testing on the land, on the land surrounding the building is studied on the surface 
and test borings regarding subsurface conditions are taken and sent to a certified laboratory for scientific testing and analysis. We will only have the required access after we have executed the order of taking. Furthermore, there are legal and appraisal fees associated with the eminent domain action. Therefore, the total amount requested is for 16.4 million, which is 15.9 for the property and 500,000 for the other items I have enumerated. The reason for moving ahead on this eminent domain action is that we need to, the cost information that we will obtain once we are entitled to test the building and land for environmental reasons. And we will use the information to most effectively plan a schedule for the construction phase of the BHS process, project, which will in turn affect the cost. We hope to put this project before Brookline voters in the spring of 2018, but it would be less prudent to do so if we do not have information about the environmental conditions. Deputy Town Administrator Melissa Goff and Treasurer Gina Franconi have put together a short-term borrowing plan, and the first payments under that plan would be due in fiscal year 19, that's next July or afterwards. And the first payments, and the, and, and the payments would be part of, of the debt exclusion package. If the debt exclusion does not pass, we will be able to use bond premiums to pay down debt service while we devise a different plan for municipal use of the property, and we certainly have many municipal uses. This is the most ambitious and complex project that the town has ever taken on. It is incumbent upon us to have thorough planning and execution so that we will have a resulting expansion of BHS, which after all is our ma a major community facility as well as our high school, and it will serve this community well for many, many decades. The Board of Selectmen has voted favorable action by a five to zero vote that was on October 31st, and I ask that you also vote favorable action. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown and Ms. Smith. Would you come forward and sit in the front row, please? Cliff Brown, Precinct 14. Uh, by a vote of 21 to nothing, uh, the advisory committee recommends favorable action on Article 4 as amended. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Um, hi, my name is Kim Smith. And I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 6 and also a resident of Brinkton Road. I am back this time to voice my support as well as the support of my Brinkton Road neighbors for Article 4 motion offered by the Board of Selectmen, which authorizes the Board of Selectmen, it is still called the Board of Selectmen at this point, to appropriate funds necessary to acquire 111 Cypress Street by purchase, gift, eminent domain, or otherwise, for the expansion of Brookline High School. I must confess that it has been quite nice living across from a low-rise office building off occupied by somewhat quiet tenants for the past 15 plus years. So it will be somewhat of an adjustment living across from a much more massive structure occupied by hundreds of lively teenagers, but, <laughs> but I think that it's not only the best site to expand B Brookline High School, but also the best use of the site. Thus, I thank the members of the Board of the Selectmen, the School Committee, and the BHS Expansion Building Committee for keeping the Brinkton Road neighbors in the loop. We look forward to working with you on this endeavor as plans proceed. I'm so glad that there is movement in a positive direction to address the need for increased school capacity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bassett. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Bassett, Precinct 6. I love this idea, but I, I, wa I wonder, and I wonder, have there been discussions with the T? Is it possible that we will be able to extend a building over the T track so as to connect directly to the rest of the campus? Ms. Hiller. Uh, to answer your question as best I can, yes, we have had discussions with the T. 
our project uh, management firm of Hill International has uh, quite a bit of experience in this area. And uh, they had very, very good meeting a few weeks ago. Uh, we were shocked that we had so much participation by the T staff. 25 people came to the meeting. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's a long process and it's going to take a lot of work. And I think we are very happy that we have gone to this project management firm because they have a lot of expertise in this area. So we're hopeful. Um, but I can't make any promises. Thank you. Ms. Kahn? Yes, Janice Kahn, Tommy member from Precinct 15. When we first heard about um, acquiring 111 Cyprus, the dollar amount that was, um, that was talked about was $11 million. And now tonight we're hearing 15.9 million plus 0.5. And I just wonder why that cost has gone up and if, um, this, if this body can be assured that this is the final um, amount that we will be asked to fund. Mr. Wyshynski. Uh, Neil Wyshynski, Board of Selectmen. <clears throat> um, I don't know where you heard the 11 uh, that may have been the assessed value. Uh, um, I will say that, uh, you know, an eminent domain appraisal is a very different beast than a normal appraisal. And the eminent domain process is different than the normal sale and purchase. So the Pro Tanto Award is based on a professional appraisal uh, done by an eminent, eminent domain appraiser. Um, so after we pay the pro tanto award, uh, if the owner is unsatisfied with that uh, uh, amount of money, uh, the owner can then sue us, um, and then it would go into the courts and could eventually wind up even in a jury trial. So there's, there's no assurance that the 15-9 that we're paying in the pro tanto will be the final uh, uh, amount that we pay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gilman. My name is Jane Gilman, Precinct 3, and my question also goes to how the pro tanto figure was derived. So I thank you, Mr. Wyshynski, for that explanation. I'd like to know um, how much we paid for that and how that fee was negotiated also. Uh, is, is my question clear? Yeah. Okay. Town Council. Jocelyn Murphy, Town Council. Um, I don't recall how much the, the full appraisal cost. I would have to review our records. I do know that the phase one appraisal cost $15,000. Um, I believe uh, the appraisal in total, total was upwards of thirty-five dollars or $45,000, but I'm not certain of that figure. Thank you. Thank yes, you. sir. Hi. Um, Brian Hochleitner, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 6. I was also on the 111 Cyprus uh, committee, study committee. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is I noticed in the description that the taking is proposed to be a taking of fee title to the parcel, leaving in place all of the existing easements of record that are shown on the plans. And I just wanted someone who's familiar with those easements to talk a little bit about them and just kind of make sure we understand them. That's one question. And then the second question is, there's been a lot of discussion about eminent domain recently, um, not just for this site, but for other sites. And there's been some suggestion that um, there's a requirement for eminent domain that, that the taking be shown to be necessary. And I just wanted town council to weigh in on whether that's an argument that the landowner here could, could use to try to fight the taking. Thank you. Peter Ditto. Mr. Ditto. This is uh, in response to your question about easements. Peter Ditto, Director of Engineering and Transportation. There are four easements that have come with that property. Um, there's a Tony. <coughs> there's four easements that encumber with that land. There's a <coughs> 10 foot wide sore easement that runs parallel to the T tracks. There's a 12-foot-wide 
right of right of way easement that runs from Brinkton Road to the rear of house number 25. There is a 15 foot wide so, uh, storm drain easement that comes across from um, Brinkton Road heading towards the um, tr uh, train tracks. Um, and the last easement is the Village Brook storm drain easement, which is 20 feet wide, and it runs parallel to the um, C-line tracks. I'm sorry, D-line tracks. And I take it none of these would materially interfere with the uh, what we have in mind for that site? No. Thank you. Ms. Town Council? Jocelyn Murphy, Town Council. In response to Mr. Hochlutner's question, um, there is no doubt, I think, from the history of what uh, various boards and committees have been facing for the past several years, that there is a great need for school space. This space has been identified as an appropriate uh, space for enlarge for expansion of the high school. Certainly the owner could challenge uh, the validity of the taking, but I don't think uh, he would be successful. Certainly a school is a valid public purpose. Thank you. On the motion on the TAN supplement to appropriate $16.4 million through bonding under Chapter 44 of the General Laws, those in favor, please raise your hands. Those opposed? That motion carries unit, uh, 214 to 1. I'm sorry. Uh, 214 in favor, one abstention. And one opposed. Yeah. Uh, would you raise your hand if you wish to abstain? I, uh, two abstentions. Okay, it's 212 in favor, one opposed, and th th two abstentions. Motion carries by a two-thirds vote. Uh, we'll now have a test vote <clears throat> to see if the electronic voting system is back up and running. Uh, the motion for the test vote will be uh, moved that Ma the Commonwealth of Massachusetts should say it again? No, no. Re resolve that uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts secede from the Union. <laughs> this is a second test vote. Keep your fingers crossed. All right. The uh, resolve that br the town of Brookline secede from the union. <clears throat> It'll be a little tougher. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we'll proceed with um, Article 5 and hope that we, uh, hope that the system will be back up and running tomorrow evening when we'll probably really need it. Uh, Article 5. The motion is for no action. It's moved by Mr. Wyshynski and seconded by Ms. Benka. The reason for the no action vote is that the subject matter is dealt with in the first special town meeting, which we've uh, adjourned until we've disposed of Article 5. We have now disposed of Article 5. If you vote in favor of uh, no action, those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. And I call up, adjourn the special town meeting for the purpose of dealing with
the first special town meeting. But before we get to that, it's 8 o'clock, and that's the time at which the second town meeting was scheduled to convene. So I call to order the second town, special town meeting and call for a vote, a motion to, uh, uh, by the way, on uh, both the first and second special town meetings, I have the affidavit of the town clerk relating to the proper posting and publication of the warrants for these meetings, just to get that out of the way. Okay, I will take a motion under the <clears throat> second special town meeting to adjourn that meeting until we have disposed of Article 15 on the warrant for the regular meeting. Is there a second? All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. And I now adjourn the second special town meeting to be reconvened after we deal with Article 15. And I reconvene the first special town meeting under which we have one article and the motion offered under that article is found on the blue supplement on pages 9 and 10 that the town reappropriate a million dollars that was appropriated in the, at the annual town meeting for the purpose of studies and feasibility studies and other matters relating to new school sites. It's moved by Mr. Wyshynski and seconded by Ms. Benka. Now, I've sent a couple of communications to all of you concerning the debate under this article. This is not a debate in which we will be debating the relative merits or demerits of the various school sites under consideration. And there are many of you who have uh, strong opinions about these issues. Well, those opinions should be kept to yourselves in this forum. There will be plenty of opportunity before a selection is made, but the selection of a school site is the legal province of the Board of Selectmen and the school committee and not town meeting. You will have your opportunity to, uh, when, when, the, when town meeting is asked to appropriate funding for a specific site, to go into all of the details of why you think the site is appropriate or not. But that's not our business tonight. Our business is simply to uh, deal with the reappropriation of these funds for the purpose of studies. And uh, if, we, if you stray into forbidden territory, your moderator will uh, ease you back onto the proper road. I hope that won't be necessary. So I call on Ms. Nobrega, Mr. Saltzman, and Ms. Bernard, who will have 12 minutes to present this article. Well, our electronic nightmare. Aha. Uh -huh. It's here. There we are. Dan, how do I? I just pulled it down like that. Okay. Am I cleared to begin? 
Yep. Okay. Go right ahead. Okay. Good evening, my name is Mariah Nobrega. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 4 and a member of advisory. I'm a co-petitioner on Article 1 along with Dan Saltzman and Lauren Bernard. Last May, I stood here at this podium and I urged you all to vote and to support the funding to study the Baldwin site. There we go. Um, as you know, at that time, there were some issues with the Baldwin site, traffic, open space, walkability, but the vision for the proposed school was exciting. So even though I care greatly about those issues too, I and many others put them aside in favor of the school. You are all aware of the Baldwin land restrictions that arose following that vote and the subsequent shift in focus to Pine Manor. The shift didn't make the most sense to me, but I was still hopeful that this would mean our school capacity issues could be addressed. However, with this new site came new concerns that stacked on top of the old concerns about Baldwin. You've heard these too eminent domain of any site, let alone this particular site, in the college's adamant, sorry, maybe, here we go, rejection of the proposal. Before we drafted Article 1 as a replacement for Article 5, I was genuinely concerned about being able to build a school anywhere due to the infeasibility or simple unpopularity among the majority of people that I talked to around town about these proposals. Something needed to change. Enter Article 1. This Warren article, hopefully, maybe, there we go. <laughs> this Warren article enables pursuit of a two-site school solution in North and South Brookline that, most importantly, is likely to succeed in an override. It does not markedly, if at all, delay needed school capacity. It is green, prioritizing walkability, reduced traffic, and redevelopment. It is cost neutral, if not more cost effective, compared to a highly commuter school, and addresses current inequity in the Pierce School. What does Article 1 do? First, it authorizes um, us to continue to uh, study um, Baldwin and Pine Manor to further understand the challenges and opportunities of those two sites, while also opening up the door for parallel studies at other high potential sites around town. These include Pierce, for which Dan will share some basic feasibility information with you, as well as Baker and other sites to be named. This first stage is not complete until there's public presentation of the results of these studies. We need to hold our boards accountable for appropriate due diligence on the sites to be studied so that we move ahead with the right solution for the highest number of Brookline residents. When that public process is complete, the boards will select a school capacity option at either one site or multiple sites and the next phase of feasibility work will commence. The benefits of this approach are threefold. First, a two-site solution will add capacity where it's most needed while still respecting the walkability and green values that most Brookline residents hold. You'll hear more about this from Dave Gashik shortly. Second, Pierce has been identified as the next school for renovation anyway, so whether the site is part of addressing school capacity or not, a study of Pierce is useful for the future. Third, if we find ourselves once again where we were after Baldwin fell through with a site that is basically unfeasible, we will not be, be back at square one but we'll have information from which to make a next best choice. To be clear, the benefits described here are only accrued if the board holds a complete, if the boards hold a complete, honest, transparent study process, and we TMs need to hold them accountable for this. Article one is not intended to provide a thin veneer of respectability on a foregone conclusion. Anything less than a thorough study that allows us to understand the trade-offs and potential of the various options is doing a disservice to taxpayers, to students and their families, and to all the residents of Brookline. I urge you to vote favorable action on Article 1, and with that, I turn it over to Dan. Dan Saltzman, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 6. Um, Article 1 is for all of Brookline. Article 1 is not a self-interested peer school article. My three kids go to Pierce. My family, my kids, we will all be negatively impacted by Pierce being part of a, of a solution to this problem. We're proposing this for the future of all of Brookline. Article 1 provides a range of options. It gives the town flexibility with many options. We need a range of options for Brookline. Not only a ninth school at Baldwin or Pine Manor, a two-site, multi-site solution must also be studied as well. So let's look at a two-site north-south solution that would include, in this example, Pierce School. We'll look at feasibility, schedule, and cost. Feasibility. Pierce is feasible as a North Brookline solution. 
site can hold up to 1,160 students. It's an increase of 390 currently. Maintains devotions, ratio of students per acre of usable school space. Peer districts like Wellesley and Winchester have much larger schools, albeit some other form of elementary school, like a K through five or a six through eight. No peer districts implement a K through eight model. A new Pierce would be appropriately, appropriately designed for the enrollment. Let's look at the schedule. Every option has scheduling uncertainties. Benefits of Pierce, the town owns the land, there's potential for friendly acquisition, there's no Article 97 restrictions, and there's slim litigation risk. There's drawbacks. Complexity of the site could complicate the schedule. Pine Manor site has had minimal study to date. There are open questions of flooding and other issues as well as litigation challenges. Mini Baldwin, also minimal study to date, questions of traffic management as well as litigation challenges. Baldwin with the Pine Manor land swap that's been studied a bit more, but, overlap, or, but overcoming land swap has many obstacles. All the options bring uncertainties. All options must be diligently studied. Let's look at cost. Transportation costs means that it's cheaper to expand Pierce now rather than renovate at some uncertain time later. We're going to look at three scenarios, a one-site ninth school, a one-site ninth school plus a Pierce renovation where it's not expanded, or a proposed two-site solution. In this first option, we have a three-section school built in two years, an operating override of $7.6 million plus the cost of BHS, which will be around $175 million. That's a tax increase of 10.4%. Let's look at the second scenario. That's scenario one, plus we renovate, but not expand Pierce in five years. Everybody agrees that it needs to be renovated. So we have the same operating override, same BHS cost, the tax increase goes up to 13.7%. Let's look at the third solution, a proposed two-site solution, where we expand and replace Pierce, plus add two sections somewhere in South Brookline. As you can see, the operating override goes down to 7.3 million. BHS is the same, the overall tax increase is actually less, and that's because of the reduced busing. Cost-wise, this can make sense. So expanding capacity, why, why study Pierce? School committee has said that Pierce is next in line to be renovated anyways. Why? Further study will show. Pierce is overcrowded. Pierce enrolls nearly two times more kids than in the 1970s. It's poorly designed. Here's a picture of the library. That's also the classrooms. You'll see there's no walls there because it's an open plan. Many classrooms have no walls. Some kids need noise-canceling headphones just to concentrate. There's poor construction at the, at the facility. It can't be brought up to code without massive expense. There's inadequate and failing plumbing and electrical, inadequate HVAC, not ADA compliant. This is not equitable. I don't know why we can't see that. Um, there are buffer zones that Pierce is surrounded by. Five schools buffer, five schools surround Pierce. If we were to choose Pierce as a site, we could draw from these five zones. You can see Pierce here in the middle, and we've got five schools, Lawrence, Devotion, um, Driscoll, Runkle, and, uh, and, and Lincoln, all border Pierce. So it touches five buffer zones, that's unique. Adding capacity at Pierce allows pulling in kids from five other bordering schools. It maintains walkability, which is very important. It maintains neighborhood schools. It maintains our communities. So voting for this article is really only the first step. We must vote for Article 1, and then we must ensure that the study process is legitimate. We must ensure the decision hasn't already been made. We must ensure due diligence in this process. Good evening. My name is Lauren Bernard and I am the third co-petitioner on Article 1, as well as a town meeting member from Precinct 8. I want to explain that unlike my co-petitioners, I am not a Pierce parent. As a devotion parent and as the director of the district's largest after-school program, DASEP, I know all too well the difficulties of educating children in an overcrowded school. I joined Mariah and Dan as a co-petitioner on this Warren article because I am convinced that serious study of a two-site solution that includes the renovation expansion of Pierce School is the best foot forward to addressing the serious need for expanded school capacity in both North and South Brookline, 
all while maintaining our priorities of neighborhood walkable schools, our communities, and the preservation of open space. I also believe that more voters would be willing to get behind Pearson and override than other sites under consideration. You've already heard from my co-petitioners why we think our solution merits further study, and that is the letter of Article I. My remarks here are to address the spirit of Article I, and in doing so, I wish to emphasize three commitments that we, and by we, I mean all of us in leadership, in uh, leadership positions of town uh, government, town meeting members, select, men, uh, select board members, <laughs> school committee members, and advisory committee members. The, the commitments that we make to voters and taxpayers as elected and appointed officials, and these commitments are the commitment to transparency, the commitment to due diligence, the commitment to accountability. I had drafted a carefully crafted set of remarks to illustrate these commitments. Then I realized that our selectmen had already done much of the work for me in their supplement, and for this I want to thank you. Um, therefore, please allow me to quote from the selectmen's approved language of our article, as well as from the blue selectmen supplement that we all have. First, on the commitment to transparency, <clears throat> and I quote from article language approved by the Board of Selectmen. Quote, Following a public process, the boards may expend an additional $400,000 for feasibility design services. And if following the public process, the boards determine multiple sites are preferred, it may expend an additional $300,000 for a total of $700,000 for feasibility design services. The key words here are public process. One where decisions are debated and taken in the public realm and not in secret and not behind closed doors. A public process, therefore, equals a transparent process. On the commitment to due diligence, and this would be on page eight of the Selectman Supplement, completing feasibility and moving forward with schematic design and a building project requires additional study. Warrant Article I enables this work and requires study of several sites. Indeed, a resounding vote for Article I will send a clear message to our leadership that we expect nothing short of due, true due diligence. In other words, a careful and thorough study of our two-site solution proposal along with the other sites. Anything less than true due diligence would be, frankly, a misuse of public funds to reach what some feel may be a predetermined decision. To continue to prioritize exclusively sites that have thus far proven quite problematic would be a blatant disregard for anyone's definition of due diligence. Thirdly, on the commitment of, to accountability, Town meeting holds the power of the purse, a responsibly that we should not take lightly. It is our job to assure that taxpayers' money will be spent wisely and that our, hold our officials accountable in the expenditure of those funds. In conclusion, Article I asks to fund, along with other sites, a thorough study of a two-site solution that includes the renovation of Pierce to address very pressing capacity needs in both North and South Brookline. Moreover, we are asking to do right by taxpayers in this study. A resounding vote for Article I would hold our selectmen, school committee, and other officials accountable to their words here, accountable to their votes of favorable action on this article, and most important, accountable to Brookline taxpayers by performing true due diligence with regard to feasibility studies for sites outside of their preferred sites, such as Pierce, and doing this in an honest and transparent public process. I urge you to vote favorable action on Article I, and thank you for your time. Point of order, Mr. Moderator. Yes, Mr. Spiegel. Stanley Spiegel from Precinct 2. Could you please help me out now? We've heard in the last few minutes words of, of uh, disapproval of Pine Manor and, and Baldwin and of approval for Pierce. What exactly is it that we're not supposed to be well, hearing in this Mr. debate. Well, Mr. Spiegel, no, I, this, was, this was always going to be a difficult problem. No, that's, well, uh, and I think you did not hear uh, anything more than the, a reference to the problems that the, uh, we've encountered with both those sites. So in the uh, debate, excuse, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, in the debate people can refer, that ensues to, other sites that they also think are good, or uh, what, what's out of bounds? I'm just trying to get guidance here. Well, I'm trying to moderate a difficult debate, Mr. Sure. Spiegel, and, uh, and I I, I'm very, very reluctant to 
to uh, <coughs> interfere, to uh, silence people who have obviously put a great deal of thought and effort into their presentations. And unless I hear something egregious, uh, I, I'll give them some latitude. Thank notwithstanding you, my uh, admonition at the beginning of the article. Thank you, sir. Yes. Um, Andrew Fisher, Precinct 13. Well, you know, Mr. Fisher, we have uh, a dozen speakers on the speakers list, and if you can, if you have a comment, fine. If you have a point of order, I'll hear it. I have but, a question. Uh, I'm willing to return to the well, microphone. Well, then, wh do why don't you uh, hold your question until we have a Q&A period? Yes, ma'am. I wanted to speak to the um, mention of transparency. I'm Koenia Givens, Precinct 4. I'm a proponent for this article, and I was really glad to hear the, the issue of transparency come up. Well, um, uh, would you, yeah. I, I'm going to hear from other speakers okay. on the speakers list, and uh, if we have time to get to you, uh, I'll, I'll take comments from the floor as we go through the uh, speakers list and please come to a mic at that time, Ms. Benka. Carla Benka, town meeting member, precinct 13, speaking on behalf of the advisory committee. There probably aren't many, if any, people in this auditorium who haven't asked or been asked the question, where are we gonna build the ninth school? Pine Manor, Baldwin, none of the above. This article asked town meeting members and others to consider a different question. How should we address increased student enrollment in our schools? It's a broader question, one that encourages more flexible thinking, and one we should embrace. If approved, this article would start two processes. The first, for which $300,000 is sought, would continue the ex exploration of one, building a school on the campus of Pine Manor College on approximately seven acres of land, either purchased or taken by eminent domain. Two, building a school on the Baldwin School site via the procedures stipulated by Article 97 and the National Park Service, including a land swap to make up for the parkland impacted by the school construction. And three, building a school on the unrestricted 1.46 acres of the Baldwin School site, in which case no swap would be required. Further due diligence regarding these three options would include traffic studies, comparative cost analyses, complete legal analyses where appropriate, and an appraisal of the Pine Manor parcel. The second process, running concurrently with the first and to be funded with a portion of that same $300,000, would be to undertake site evaluations of the Baker and Pierce campuses, as well as any other property identified as worthy of exploration. Such evaluations would include legal, environmental, and engineering issues, as well as site planning, design, and cost studies. Once the evaluations are completed, they would be publicly discussed to the extent advised by town council. The decision to move forward with a one-site or multi-site solution would be made by the select board and the school committee with input from the advisory committee's ad hoc subcommittee. Further feasibility of the site or sites would follow. Up to $400,000 could be spent for further feasibility for one site and an additional $300,000 could be spent for further feasibility for multi-sites. Article 1 is not prescriptive. It does not eliminate the three existing options of Pine Manor, Baldwin with a swap, and unrestricted Baldwin. It does not require demolishing Pierce. It does not look to building a second school on the Baker site. It does, however, offer needed flexibility by raising the possibility of pursuing a multi-site solution to our school capacity problem. One potential scenario under this article would be to address South Brookline's needs by expanding Baker via building more classrooms and right-sizing dedicated spaces such as staff offices, library, gym, and cafeteria, and to address North Brookline's needs by renovating and expanding the Pierce School located in what many regard as the epicenter of capacity deficit. 
It bears repeating that a multi-site solution could allow us to address the problem where it actually exists and to maintain Brookline's walkable school tradition treasured by so many. In addition, it could keep school communities intact, address the issue of equity, and cast a wider net to gain support for a debt exclusion override. We need a new school and we need it now. While succinctly summarizing the current situation does not acknowledge the hurdles, be they cost, legal challenges, delays due to litigation, or political opposition, that need to be overcome in order to reach that goal. Determining just how high those hurdles are requires additional study and analysis, and that's what this article offers. Expansion at Baker may not be possible because of the SJC's decision in the Westfield case. Pierce may be too expensive, and eminent domain taking at Pine Manor may involve too many unknowns in terms of final costs and possible delays. Right now, we simply don't know enough and without a sufficient knowledge base, it would be unwise to proceed with a particular scheme that we think or hope is the way to go. By a vote of 23 in favor, one opposed, and no abstentions, the advisory committee asks you to support the motion found on pages 9 to 10 of the supplement and to reappropriate $1 million from last May's special appropriation 67 to help us find a su successful solution to our school capacity oh. challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wyshynski. Neil Wyshynski for a unanimous Board of Selectmen. Article 1 provides funding to continue the search to solve the school capacity problem. You've heard about the carved up classrooms, lunch at, lunches at 10, classrooms and hallways and tunnels, class size inching up. We're out of space and we need to get a solution going now given the lead time it takes to get something built. You're also aware of the recent ruling from the National Park Service regarding protection of the rear part of the Baldwin site. This doesn't necessarily kill the Baldwin site, but clearly it makes it much more difficult. In September, we announced the expansion of sites under consideration to land at the corner of Heath and Woodland Road owned by Pine Manor College. Last month, we held a public hearing and we heard from the public and members of the Pine Manor community. The suggested vote will permit us to take a deep breath, take stock, and continue the evaluation of sites, including some additional sites. And then after a public process and discussion, yes, we will have a public process and discussion, a site decision will be made by the select board. By that time, we will, we will be called the select board and the school committee with the advice of the ninth school ad hoc subcommittee of the advisory committee. And then we can proceed to the beginnings or the continuation of design work depending on the selected site or sites. Let me talk a little about what will be happening. We will not be starting from scratch. We'll be studying a number of sites quickly over a 90 to 120 day period with professional assistance. The kinds of things that we'll be uh, looking at are at the full Baldwin site, understanding the possibilities of a land swap to make last spring's Baldwin design possible. In Baldwin North, that's the small Baldwin site, updating traffic for a full school or a reduced school to assess whether this, this option is feasible. At Pine Manor, further develop legal and cost considerations. At Baker, revisit the site evaluation of last year with a new with the new legal landscape in, after Westfield in mind. Revisit the program for two schools, but this time of various sizes. Uh, a building evaluation as a renovation or a modest expansion part of a possible two-site solution and a cost analysis. At Pierce, a site evaluation for two schools, a site evaluation for a devotion-sized expansion, a site evaluation for renovation, modest expansion along with a cost analysis, and we'll also consider whether MSBA participation is possible. Other sites may also be identified. There's going to be a lot of work over the next few months. To help us coordinate and quarterback the process, we'll be bringing on Joe Connolly. Joe guided the devotion project through some crucial phases and was this interim school superintendent prior to Andrew Bott's appointment. I'm looking forward to Joe's calm, steady hand and can-do attitude to make sure all the pieces are coming together. As the process unfolds, 
We'll be posting materials on the website and announcing meetings and hearings. Let me also say that the Board of Selectmen will be approaching this with an open mind. As I've said every time I've had the opportunity, every site comes with pros and cons, and I'm also learning that each site comes with its own set of lawyers. <laughs> just last week, just last week in response to this warrant article, we received a letter from a lawyer hired by what's becoming now a familiar phrase, concerned citizens of Brookline, this time about the Baker site, with a similar tone and message that we've been receiving from lawyers regarding the Baldwin Pine Manor sites. So none of this is easy. We're fully aware of the public discussion and controversies surrounding each of the sites. We're aware of the difficulties and controversies surrounding eminent domain. I personally am committed to only using eminent domain as a last result. But we're running out of options and the use of eminent domain needs to be on the table. We need to keep all our options on the table. Through it all, we must remember who we're doing this for. Through all the meetings, hearings, traffic studies, advocacy for and against a particular site, lawyer statements and letters, what keeps me going is the knowledge that we're doing this for the children. The children are here. They need a place to learn. Education is Brookline's brand. It's the core of who we are as a town. It's why many of us have moved here and why many of us live here. Our school system and the children it educates needs us to decide on a course and then come together. On behalf of the Board of Selectmen, I urge a favorable action vote on the motion before you. Mr. Pollock and Mr. O'Reilly, would you come forward and sit in the front row, please? David Pollock, town meeting member, Precinct 11, and chairman of the Brookline School Committee. Um, Thank you, Neil. You said a lot of uh, things that I would second, and just in particular, I would say that uh, I would, in, in speaking for the school committee, I would say that we too come to this with an open mind and embrace transparency. Our elementary schools are all overcrowded, and the school committee shares the frustration and the sense of urgency that is being felt throughout our community, and particularly by our school families and our educators. Much has been done to address the dramatic enrollment growth in our schools, passing two operating overrides and the devotion debt exclusion, hiring new teachers and staff, and adapting and enlarging our existing school buildings so that they continue to serve as well as possible. But more needs to be done, and we need another elementary school as soon as possible. Ten years ago, only two of our elementary schools served more than 550 students. Today each and every one of them does. We've absorbed more than 1,500 additional elementary students over a dozen years, and we are expecting hundreds more. This 40% growth to date is the equivalent of more than three schools worth based on the average enrollment at the beginning of the expansion, all squeezed into our eight existing schools. Class sizes have grown significantly by an average of 10%, and we now have 80 classrooms with 22 or more students. Children are learning in hallways and stairwells and every kind of available space throughout our buildings. We've added 58 classrooms at our eight schools. We've built classrooms, divided classrooms, made classrooms out of hallways and locker rooms and libraries and offices. We're renting space for classroom. We've leased modular classrooms. At this point, we have no more room for classrooms. But more importantly, while we've been adding all these classrooms and teachers, we have not been adding all of the other spaces that are essential for schooling. Gymnasiums, cafeterias, auditoriums, and libraries are all now way too small for the number of kids in our buildings. Children eat lunch starting before 10.30 a.m and they take physical education at the teen center. The same is true for smaller spaces. In the 2015 override, we added many much needed math and literacy specialists, guidance counselors, nurses, but we didn't add any space for them to work with their students. 
The school committee unanimously recommends favorable action on Warren Article 1 as voted uh, by the Board of Selectmen. And furthermore, the school committee also voted unanimously in favor of the following sentence included in the Board of Selectmen's supplemental recommendation. Quote, the study process will be strategic in order to spend the funds wisely and timely in order to make a decision to meet the annual town meeting time frame and to inform the fiscal year 2019 budget process, including a potential tax override proposal. The school committee embraces the opportunity to take a step back and look at our options, but we don't have a whole lot of time. The bottom line is that we are educating children in hallways in every one of our school buildings and this has to stop. Mr. O'Reilly and Mr. Gassiach, would you please come forward and sit in the front row? Thank you, moderator Gatsby. Good evening, my name is Thomas Sim O'Reilly. I am president of Pine Manor College, 400 Heath Street, Brookline, Massachusetts, home of the 2017 ACAA men's soccer champions, the Gators. We're very proud of that. And for all of you who've received our letter at looking for support and have sent the checks in, thank you so much. It means a lot to the students. Thank you. Pine Manor College, we are a neighbor a friend who shares what we can in the home of more than 300 Brookline residents. We are a community that consists of 85% people of color, 84% first in the families to attend college, 80% low income, 50% multilingual. Pine Manor College is a long-standing and good citizen of Brookline. We are taxpayers in a direct party of interest in the warrant article before you. I respect the responsibility we all have to ensure the future education of the children of Brookline. I'm a former president and member of the Boston School Committee. My spouse is the chair of a school committee. Our children have been and continue to be educated in public schools. We take this responsibility deeply, just as you do. As president of Pine Manor College, I hold that same obligation for the student residents who call Pine Manor College home. Together, you and I, Pine Manor College community, we share common ground as neighbors in this wonderful town and as individuals sharing a commitment to educating young people. Tonight, I want to applaud the efforts of the 200 plus parents who have recommended the Article 1 alternative siting proposal. They've worked hard to open up the siting process, to make it more transparent, to find a pathway forward that builds on consensus, that offers an opportunity for joy, and that more closely holds to the values and the principles of Brookline that were agreed to upon this school siting process. As you deliberate Article 1 in future matters pertaining to the suitability and unsuitability of specific school sites, I hope you'll keep those agreed upon values and principles front and center. As site considerations are made, let us ask these questions. Does the location ensure education for all without putting the education of some at risk? Does the location honor Brookline's commitment to open space in general as well as the open space goals adopted by the town? Will Brookline adhere to the nine citing factors recommended by the Climate Action Committee and adopted by the Board of Select Members? Will Brookline fulfill its commitment of not using eminent domain against any property where people reside? 
Will Brookline's leaders make decisions through an open and transparent process? And will Brookline value all residents equally and fairly? This article was intended to be about funding the feasibility of a school siting. But unfortunately, the issue has become bigger than just finding a suitable location for an elementary school. It has become a pivotal moment in Brookline's history and what Brookline stands for. I understand that this is an enormous responsibility. But I have faith that this body and the entire Brookline community will do the right thing. Pine Manor College accepts Article 1 as a sign of willingness by the town of Brookline to rethink, with an open mind, prior citing considerations for finding a suitable location that best encompasses the stated values and principles of the town. Not one value, not one principle, but the combination of values and principles we strive to represent. We have the ability to do that if we make values our commitment. As a party of interest and a taxpaying resident of Brookline, Pine Manor College has a stake in this decision and should be represented at the table. I offer the limited resources of the college to host and support the siting effort. And indeed myself to serve on the committee that will lead to the siting effort in order to provide balance and alternative perspective. I am confident that together we can find a solution that meets the needs of the entire community. Please keep the college in mind as you go on tonight and tomorrow night, whatever other nights it takes, to consider Articles 16, 17, 19, 20, and 21. We are Brookline too. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your commitment to Brookline and all its residents. And thank you so much for taking all of my calls and the meeting time that so many of you have been willing to give me to hear the message of the college and the concerns we have with the process. Thank you. So I'm uh, grateful to you, Mr. Uh, O'Reilly. Thank you. Mr. Gossiach? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dave Gayshock, a guest here from Precinct 13, parent of two young children at Heath Elementary School, and a member of the Ninth School Building Committee, otherwise known as the MAPS guy. So I'm here to speak in support of Article 1, and I want to give you the geographic context of why. Chairman Wyshynski commented that education is Brookline's brand, and I couldn't agree more. This is a big part of why. 80% or more of our kids currently live within walking distance of their school. 64% of our families report that their kids typically walk to school. And that's important not just because of the way those kids get to school. That's what allows those parents and families to actively participate, walk in and out, meet teachers, meet principals, and meet and interact with each other to strengthen our school communities. That's important. That's why our brand is education. 
Most of our population is in the north end of town. There are six districts north of that red line that I've drawn on this map, two districts south of it. 75% of our kids live north of that line and 25% live south. There's a particular period of low density in a swath diagonally across the southern part of town that makes this process very tricky. And that's why our schools are located where they are right now. So where do we project that we'll have this demand that we need to meet? Unfortunately, not all in one place, but also not all over town. The biggest chunk of this projected demand, including projected 40B development, is in the north end of town right around Pierce in that yellow area. The second biggest chunk is in the southern southeast corner of town east of Baker. That's going to be driven largely by how many incremental kids we ultimately get from Hancock Village expansion. Our 40B projections are also grouped in certain parts of town that are indicated by the orange circles. The original solution to this space crunch was focused on Baldwin and Pine Manor, which is shown in red vis-a-vis -vis where our need is. Very few kids could walk there. Lots of vehicles would have to transport them there. It's very different from our current situation. I'm speaking in support of STM1 because it brings into the picture and into consideration many more options that may allow us ultimately to build a school that is in keeping with our brand, in keeping with Brookline's educational tradition, whether that be a single site option or a multi-site option. These are just some of the options that I've illustrated in green on the map. And we're keeping Baldwin and Pine Manor in the mix because if they emerge as the best feasible options, then they are what we should go with. Most importantly, this. Any single site solution in the southern part of Brookline is going to require us to redistrict 400 children, <coughs> approximately, from the north side of that red line and pull them to a school that's located south. Doesn't matter where the, whether that's at Baldwin, Pine Manor, Baker or anywhere else. If you build a single three-section school south, this is what happens. North is better, but not perfect, because if we build a single three-section school north, we have to do the opposite for a smaller number of kids and pull 200 kids who live south to a school in the north. You have one minute. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. As you can see, I've illustrated here on the map the in red, the rough am amount of geography that would be required for where those kids live to pull them to a south school like Heath or Pine Manor or elsewhere. And in purple, the rough geography it would take to pull kids who live south of that line north to Lincoln or to Runkle. What STM1 does is it allows us to address both of our areas of need with targeted capacity that is in those areas. It allows us to put schools, new school capacity where our kids live and increase our walkability and community involvement as opposed to decrease it. So I join the prior speakers in urging town meeting to strongly or even unanimously support STM1 and then it's time for us to roll up our sleeves and help and support the boards in the open, transparent, data-driven process that, to which they have committed. Thank you. Mr. Vitolo and Ms. Kahn, would you please come forward? <clears throat> Tommy Vitolo, town meeting member, precinct six. I'm also a dad, both of a K-8 student and a K-8 student-to-be. Like so many in this room, I care about social and economic justice, I care about education, and I care about the environment. The way in which our town ultimately expands capacity, or doesn't, will have significant impacts on each of these things. There is broad consensus though not unanimity, that we need more K-8 capacity. 
We haven't yet determined where, but our want for capacity is clear. As my father-in-law says, want in one hand and spit in the other. See which one fills up first. And he doesn't say spit. <laughs> Until we build that K-8 capacity, our kids suffer with overpacked classrooms. That is, if they're lucky to be educated in a classroom at all, and not a closet, an administrative office, a tunnel, a stairwell, or a converted commercial space. If, despite our intentions, we fail to add capacity, what is the outcome? Do we lose METCO? Materials fees? Which kids get permanently assigned to Old Lincoln? Lots of ideas have been tossed around in the past few months with phrases like taking, one site, two site, swap, mini, skinny, mixed use, and full reno. But how many students, or how many more students, can attend school at each of those options? What are the impacts on our environment, on our taxes, the neighbors and the neighboring kids? Answering these questions will take real expertise, and that's exactly the expertise we seek to hire. By passing this Warren article, we're sending several clear messages. We're making it clear that we want more K-8 capacity. We're also making it clear that we expect our select humans and our school advisory building and so forth committees to proceed with a careful and thorough consideration of a broad variety of options, all of which will have strengths and flaws, supporters and opponents. We're making clear our expectation that our leaders perform due diligence on sites they favor and sites they shun. And we're making it clear that we expect accountability, both from our esteemed town meeting and from our town's voters. I'm in favor of a more careful study, a feasible and schematic design study at Pierce, as well as at your favorite site, and yours, and yours too. Let's gather good intel about a menu of expansion options. Then let's swiftly and thoughtfully place our order, ensuring that our ultimate expansion choice or choices are good ones when viewed through a social and economic justice, educational and environmental lens. Let's not choose to jeopardize the outstanding education available in, to students, both current and future, by failing to take action. Let's vote favorable action. Thank you. Uh, there's been a motion for the question. I'm not altogether certain how much more we can add to what you've already heard. So I will allow that motion. Uh, is there a second? All right, I have the following speakers signed up to speak, all of whom in favor of this article. Ms. Kahn, Ms. Jett, Ms. Switzer, Ms. Givens, and Dr. Reingold. Against that background, uh, on the motion for the question requires two-thirds vote. Those in favor, please raise your hands. Those opposed, motion carries by a two-thirds vote. On the motion on page 9 and 10 of the blue supplement, those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. Those in favor, please raise your hands. No, Ms. Uh, you can't interrupt a vote for that purpose, and we don't have electronic voting. The vote is overwhelmingly in favor, and I'm not even going to entertain your question, question Ms. LaPlante. I'm very sorry. All those in favor, please raise your hands. Those opposed, raise your hands. Those opposed, please stand. Okay, 200, uh, those abstaining, the vote is in, uh, motion carries by a vote of 208 to 2. <clears throat> we now move to articles 6, 7, and 8. And by the way, uh, 
I, I commend the speakers for uh, listening to my admonition and particularly uh, to the president of Pine Manor, uh, for whom I'm, to whom I'm grateful for his presentation. Uh, Article 6 and through 7 and 8, we will debate together. They all relate to various kinds of statutory assistance for the elderly and uh, the less fortunate in town. There are three motions. Article 6 uh, is found on page 6-2. Article 7 on page 7-2. Article 8 on page 8-2. They're all moved by Mr. Gordon. They're all seconded by Mr. Franco. And they all suffer the same uh, typographical problem, and that is they are missing the period at the end of the motion. So if you kindly add a period to the end of each of those motions. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm <coughs> in the, my delirium at getting uh, past Article 5 and the uh, first special town meeting. I forgot to uh, dissolve the first town meeting. So I call for a motion to dissolve the first town meeting. Uh, is there a second? All those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. I dissolve the first special town meeting, reconvene the uh, regular special town meeting, and uh, pick up where we left off, which was uh, adding periods to the end of each of these motions. Uh, I call first on Mr. Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Neil Gordon, town meeting member, precinct one, <coughs> member of the advisory committee and a member of the selectmen's committee on senior tax policy, speaking for the selectmen's committee. We know that living in Brookline is expensive and the real estate taxes will soon be subject to increases from upcoming overrides and debt exclusions. Brookline seniors living on fixed and often limited incomes are especially and increasingly vulnerable. A year ago, town meeting adopted a resolution sponsored by Susan Granoff, urging the Board of Selectmen to establish a committee to study property tax relief programs for senior homeowners with modest incomes. The Committee on Senior Tax Policy, chaired by Selectman Franco, was formed shortly thereafter. The Selectmen charged the Senior Tax Policy Committee with making policy recommendations and proposing warrant articles, both for new programs and for improvements to existing programs. I speak this evening in support of the three Warren articles that were peti petitioned as a result of the committee's work. Articles 6 and 7 relate to an existing Brookline real estate tax deferral program that under Massachusetts law allows qualifying seniors to defer the payment of their real estate taxes until they pass away or sell their homes. To be clear, this is a tax deferral program. There is no tax abatement and interest is charged on any taxes deferred. The cost to the town of administrating this program is and will, even with the increased participation we wish to encourage, it will re remain nominal. Article 6 asks the Board of Selectmen to petition the state legislature to increase the income qualification gap, a cap, from $57,000 to $86,000 by changing the reference in state law from the circuit breaker cap for single taxpayers to the circuit breaker cap for married taxpayers filing jointly as it applies to Brookline. These amounts are adjusted by the state annually for inflation. Favorable action on Article 6 would allow the town to pursue an action that would expand the number of seniors eligible to participate in the deferral program and put in place an income ceiling that better corresponds to our local need. Separately, Article 7 proposes a change in the interest rate for seniors participating in the tax deferral program. Currently, participating seniors are charged interest at a fixed 5% rate on tax payments they choose to defer. I'll note that the payment of interest is also deferred. No real estate tax or interest payments are made until the participant passes away or they sell their home. Article 7 proposes changing the fixed 5% rate to a variable rate based on the 10-year United States Treasury bond yield, a rate that is currently about 2.3%. 
the rate would be adjusted annually for new deferrals. Favorable action on Article 7 would, at the current reference rate, reduce the cost of participation in the senior tax deferral program to one that the committee feels is fair to both the town and to participating seniors. Changes in the interest rate would roughly correspond to changes in the town's long-term borrowing rate, again, something the committee feels is fair to both the town and to participating seniors. The rate, although variable, would be capped at 8% under state law. Lastly, Article 8. The committee proposed adopting a program also defined by state law to fund tax relief aid to both qualifying seniors and those with disabilities. Favorable action on Article 8 would provide a voluntary supplemental payment through a tax bill checkoff. Funds raised would be administered by a taxation aid committee as provided in the state statute. The taxation aid committee would be charged with establishing eligibility criteria and with allocating funds raised. As with the senior tax deferral program, there would be no tax abatement, no involuntary shifting of tax burden to other taxpayers, and the cost of the town is expected to be nominal. On behalf of the Selectmen's Committee on Senior Tax Policy, I encourage a vote of favorable action on Warren Articles 6, 7, and 8. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Franco. And Ms. Humphrey, would you please come forward? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and through you to the body. Ben Franco for a unanimous uh, Board of Selectmen. Uh, one year ago, as you've heard, town meeting passed a resolution that called upon the board to establish a committee to investigate the impact of property taxes on low and moderate income seniors. The board established that committee and it met for eight months earlier this year. The Selectman's Senior Tax Policy Committee has concluded its work and filed its report with the Selectman's office earlier this fall. A copy of the committee's final report has been included in the combined reports under Article 23. Among the seven recommendations that the committee urged be implemented uh, in its report are the proposals found under Warrant Articles 6, 7, and 8. And Mr. Gordon eloquently uh, articulated what each of those articles does. W while the board has yet to weigh in on, uh, on the group's other recommendations and acknowledges that there is more work to be done on the issue of senior affordability, these warrant articles are a good first step. The board recommends town meeting authorize the three proposed common sense actions at the, this town meeting and in the future other actions that will help low and moderate income seniors remain in Brookline will be evaluated and implemented. The board urges a vote of favorable action on articles 6, 7, and 8. Thank you, Ms. Humphrey. I don't have anything to add because everything has already been so superbly explained. Um, I just want to let you know the uh, recommendations from the advisory committee on warrant article 6, which increases elig eligibility through using the state's criteria. Uh, the uh, advisory committee recommends favor rec recommended favorable action by 1903 vote on uh, W um, on warrant article 7, which would enable homeowners to borrow real estate taxes. The uh, advisory recomm recommends uh, favorable action with a 14-5-3 vote. Uh, please be sure to read the write-up very carefully because it's interesting to note that it certainly behooves the heirs um, to pay off deferred taxes immediately since it will jump to 14% going forward. It's a good thing to discuss with uh, your children. Um, warrant Article 8, which establishes a fund through voluntary contributions, was voted in uh, uh, favorably um, with a 10-8-4 vote. Um, the real estate tax form would have a check off box, uh, so there are also no extra costs associated with uh, putting this program together. We urge favorable action on all three of the articles. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Carroll. Yes, I'm Frank Carroll, Precinct 10. Uh, I'm going to be brief be, because I, you know, I think there's uh, widespread support for these articles. I sh should say that these uh, uh, motions are supported uh, by Brookline Can. Uh, one thing I want to call to your attention is that at this point, uh, the participation in the tax deferral program is, is extremely modest, I think, <clears throat> since something in the order of 10. Um, it's a conceptually uh, very attractive. 
And uh, in fact, one of the uh, uh, members of the study committee, and I, I was a member of the study committee too, is Harold Peterson, uh, who is an economist, uh, a retired faculty member at uh, Boston College, uh, a member of the Board of Assessors, did a very interesting analysis looking at uh, kind of the, the, the history of uh, increases in property value uh, in, in Brookline, and if the past uh, predicts the future, he points out that kind of in, a, in effect, uh, older people who qualify for this, for the tax deferral program uh, can pay no taxes, no property taxes, and hold their own in terms of property value. We have property values that are in increasing uh, steadily. Uh, so at that, that um, you know, are in effect equivalent to the uh, to the property taxes. So, from a um, uh, it, it, there, there's an enormous resistance on the part of, of seniors uh, to uh, participating in a program of this kind because they don't want to uh, take take on debt. Uh, we really need to do some public education uh, to, to encourage uh, struggling seniors uh, to take advantage of this kind of opportunity. So I'm encouraging favorable action, and I hope that uh, we all engage in uh, public education uh, efforts to encourage seniors to take advantage uh, of this option. Thank you. Thank you. On the motion on page 6-2 under Article 6, those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Article 7, motion on page 7-2. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Article 8, motion on page 8-2. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Article 9. The main motion under Article 9, and only motion, is on the yellow supplement, pages 1 through 11 relating to a home rule amendment requesting additional liquor licenses for the town of Brookline, moved by Mr. Franco, seconded by Ms. Jonas. Mr. Franco. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ben Franco for unanimous board of selectmen. Uh, I'll begin with some context. The number of liquor licenses a municipality may issue as of right is governed by state law and is based on the municipality's population. Put simply, the bigger a community is, the more licenses it has to issue. When a municipal municipality's quota of licenses is exhausted, that city or town is able to issue new licenses to applicants, excuse me, is unable to issue new uh, is licenses to applicants, and the number of alcohol serving establishments is capped at the quota limit. This is the situation the town of Brookline is in. In October, we issued our last liquor license and all 75 of our licenses to serve alcohol in restaurants are spoken for. When a community runs out of licenses, it can uh, receive additional licenses by approaching the state legislature and requesting that it be given an additional allotment. In recent years, several communities have pursued additional licenses and by and large, these communities have been successful in re obtaining them. In order to receive additional licenses, legislation must be filed, and that legislation must go through the normal lawmaking process of being approved by the House of Representatives and the State Senate before being signed by the governor. That brings us to Article 9. Article 9 seeks town meeting's permission for the town to open negotiations with the state legislature about the issuance of additional licenses through passage of special legislation. At this point, I want to give some objective facts about Article 9 as it was originally filed. Article 9 seeks 40 new liquor licenses, 35 all kinds licenses, and five beer and wine licenses. These licenses are divided equally between broad development opportunity areas and specific addresses where development is underway, has been approved, or is contemplated. It is important to understand that if the town receives licenses, it is the licenses it is poised to request, any applicant for a license would need to comply with Brookline's land use rules, zoning, and participate in a public licensing hearing before the Board of Selectmen. In short, the process for receiving a liquor license would not deviate from the process that is in place today. The most important message I can impart to you about Article 9 is that it would take months off of 
um, about Article 9 is that it would take, it would kick off months of negotiations with the legislature that will hopefully result in new liquor licenses being issued. It is very unlikely that town meeting, what town meeting approves, fingers crossed, will match exactly what the legislature uh, ultimately passes. After the bill is filed, State House staff and legislators will almost certainly tinker with the bill. But if past practice holds, the town will be called upon to participate in conversations at critical junctures to explain intent and the reality on the ground and to provide up-to-date information. I, the rest of the Board of Selectmen, and the vast majority of the Advisory Committee believe Article 9, as it was filed, is the responsible opening pr proposal for the legislature. Article 9, as it was originally filed, seeks to obtain enough licenses to meet demand far into the future. Uh, passing non-passage of Article 9 would put the, uh, the town at a severe disadvantage um, and uh, force us to wait uh, over a year, uh, possibly until the spring of 2019, until we would have enough uh, licenses or would be uh, able to get enough licenses to meet demand. In closing, the Board of Selectmen, and most especially me, appreciates the passion, for the, that those, the passion of those that have dedicated so much time to Article 9. The article as filed was the result of collaboration and conversation with legislative staff and staff from peer communities, and it represents a thoughtful approach that will position Brookline well for the dialogue we are poised to enter. Against the context of these conversations, we believe it would be unwise to alter or not pass the proposal. We all agree that more licenses are required and we intend to obtain them. The board is asking you to put us in the best position to negotiate receipt of these licenses as quickly as possible. The board recommends and asks for a vote of, for, a vote of favorable action on the motion offered under Article 9, found on, found on pages 9.1 and 9.3 of the supplement. Thank you, Mr. Davis. And at this point, there's no question about altering the motion before you, It'll either be passed or not in its current form. And Ms. Jonas, would you please come forward? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, my name is Jonathan Davis, town meeting member from Precinct 10. Uh, I agree with the concept of expanding the number of Brookline licenses. I am voting no action personally on Article 9. Uh, I don't think that it's ready for prime time. I do hope that if Article 9 <coughs> is voted down, that the selectmen will come back at a later town meeting with a better product. In your yellow supplement on page 3, section 1, uh, paragraph D provides, once issued, I'm quoting, the licensing authority shall not approve the transfer of the licenses to any other location, but it may grant the licenses to new applicants at the same location. This applies to both batches of licenses under maps 1 through 5 and 6A through 6C. Once granted, a license sticks to the property to which it is first granted and blesses the property with the right to always have a license awarded. It perpetually reserves the possibility of a license to that particular property, even if the town has already used up its other licenses. Also on page three of your supplement, section 1E provides that in the unusual situation, and it is unusual, where a license does come back to the Board of Selectmen, select persons, the board can only regrant the license, and I'm quoting here, under the same conditions as specified in this section. Those same conditions include paragraph D. Once a license is granted to a property, a license is always reserved for that particular property. This is a perpetual economic and competitive benefit to the owner of the favored property. And it creates a secondary market because the property owner can monetize the benefit by requiring tenants to pay a higher rent or by selling the property at a higher price. At the TMMA Warrant Article Forum last week, a proponent of Article 9 
said that there has been no study of the value of the economic benefit to the lucky property owners, and that there has been no study as to the additional rent that the fortunate property owners would likely charge prospective tenants. The proponent also did not know what owners of commercial property in maps one to five were being left out, not being singled out in maps one through five for perpetual license eligibility. On the other hand, if you turn to map three, all the stars on map three are being awarded to properties owned by Chestnut Hill Realty. Contrary to the proponent's argument that Article 9 is broad, Article 9 is actually quite narrow. In contrast, in the state legislation that expanded the number of Somerville's licenses, none of the Somerville's licenses are promised to particular properties. In Article 9, half of the licenses are promised to particular properties. In the Somerville case, only 20% of the Somerville licenses must be regranted to the original properties to which they were first granted. In Article 9, all of the licenses must be regranted to the original properties as to which the licenses first come to rest. I'm also troubled by the way Article 9 has been presented. First, the selectman's explanation in the original combined reports barely whispers that once a license is granted to a property, it reserves a license for that property in the future. Next, if you look at page 9-14 of the Advisory Committee's original report, in the combined reports, the AC found that Article 9, as submitted originally, had omitted a critical word from paragraph D. Then the Advisory Committee discovered that an entire paragraph, paragraph E, had been omitted from the original Article 9. Next again, in the yellow supplement, that was delivered by the police department, page 13 was missing from the advisory committee supplemental recommendation. Then again on pages 12 and missing page 13, if you are able to find the missing page 13, there is a list of seven areas that trouble the advisory committee and that they have not been able to resolve. And finally, article nine is presented as something that we must hurry and pass. I think that this hurry has led to a poorly created article that does not need to be passed tonight. I think that the selectmen have been overwhelmed with bigger and more urgent issues. And this pressure shows in a ragged and raggedly presented Article 9. It's no wonder that the selectmen themselves apologize for Article 9 by saying, well, never mind, it's only a negotiating position. We don't have to rubber stamp Article 9. We shouldn't have to hold our noses in order to pass it. I think the principle of expanding license availability is very good, but I think the execution has been faulty. I hope that both, that the article will be defeated and that the selectmen will come back at a later town meeting with a better, a more thoughtful, and a more equitable article. Thank you. Ms. Jonas. <clears throat> I apologize, that went a little too fast for me. Um, this is Elisa Jonas, and I'm speaking on behalf of the advisory committee. Um, first of all, I want to say we fully support the selectmen's effort to increase the availability of liquor licenses. They're absolutely necessary to support the commercial vibrancy of this town. And with all the liquor licenses, sorry, out of breath because I had to run. <laughs> with all the liquor licenses already given out, we currently have none to offer those restaurants um, that would like to enter the Brookline market. Um, I don't know whether Ben mentioned it, there was just the front page article in the Boston Globe. Um, I don't know if anyone saw it, it's about the hardships of restaurants in Cambridge who have to purchase licenses on the secondary market for $450,000. We don't want to have that situation in Brookline. <coughs> um, However, while we support the selectmen's efforts, there were several concerns that we discussed at the advisory committee. Um, let's see. I, don't, uh, I guess this may have been something that was already discussed, but the most significant concern is that half of all the licenses are assigned to specific tax parcels, which really limits the town's flexibility to distribute licenses as needed. Particularly concerning is that the majority of the proposed site-specific licenses 
are for locations that do not have specific development pr proposals in place, let alone particular restaurants in mind. Those licenses will be unusable unless and until a restaurant is actually ready to locate at that site. The Public Safety Committee, as well as the Advisory Committee, considered an option of transforming the site-specific licenses to ones for uh, more general commercial areas, but that would have been beyond the scope of the Warren article. There also was consideration given to requesting the 20 licenses for general development areas in this petition and submitting a second petition at a later time. To get a better sense of our options, we contacted members of our legislative delegation and we also spoke several times with Sean Leahy, who was the legal counsel for the Joint Committee on Consumer Protection and Professional Licensure. And he is the one who will be reviewing the town's petition for the Joint Committee. He told us that the currently configured Joint Committee is flexible and willing to work with the town to come up with a proposal that fits our needs. So he recommended that we submit the petition as is with 40 licenses as currently configured so that we can get the process going and then work with the committee to modify the proposal to one that is not so restrictive. The advisory committee also considered other concerns expressed by the public and by committee members, including the lack of public hearings prior to making decisions about locations for licenses and whether the particular mix of licenses being requested, 35 for full liquor and five for beer and wine only, was the best configuration in light of the experiences of other towns, which have been finding increasing demand for beer and wine only. Despite the various concerns, the advisory committee is aware of the urgency of obtaining more liquor licenses. The now vacant 1000 Villages site on Harvard Street has been the focus of inquiries by several restaurateurs, but was not pursued further by them because the town did not have any currently available liquor licenses. For that reason, the advisory committee has re recommended favorable action on Article 9 by a vote of 21 in favor, one opposed, and two abstaining, with the understanding that the selectmen will work with the joint committee to modify to the petition to one that addresses the town's needs in a better manner. Thank you, Ms. Kahn. And Ms. Miller, would you come forward, please? Sit in the front row. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Janice Kahn, town meeting member from Precinct 15. I'm also a member of the advisory committee, one of only two boards in this town that holds public hearings and reviews every warrant article in the combined reports. And that gives me unique insights into the vetting process that led to the warrant article that you will be voting on today. Um, you've heard from two previous speakers some of the problems, and that was in my remarks. But I want to go dig a little bit deeper so you really get a sense of what could have been done better. So vetting articles, which can lead to some wordsmithing or modifications within the scope of the article prior to town meeting means that what you see before you is often the clearest version of the article possible. I take that obligation to do due diligence very seriously, which is why I'm concerned about the apparent minimal due diligence on the part of the town in crafting warrant article nine, and specifically the decision to put together a proposal that limits the town's flexibility in assigning many of the liquor licenses it's requesting. Um, I agree, we, we have gone through all our quota liquor licenses, we need more liquor licenses, um, and I'm on board on, with that. Um, and was gonna stand here and say, I support Warrant Article 9, but I have to tell you that given that this body chose to deny Joel Feingold, a first time petitioner who submitted his final version of the Warrant Article within an hour after the deadline, it gives me pause that um, we would so narrowly construe um, an opportunity to look at something else. 
So I serve as chair of the Public Safety Subcommittee of the Advisory Committee. My subcommittee was assigned this article to review, which involved holding a public hearing and making a recommendation to the full advisory committee to help inform the deliberations of the full advisory committee. So you've heard no public hearings were held, no public input was received prior to the crafting of this article, and that the tax parcels, they chose to fix half of the parcels on lots that may end up being a nail salon and not be able to be used whatsoever. But more troubling from my point of view is that there was apparently little deep research done to create the town's proposal for additional licenses. The maps were created as part of the town's housing production plan process, and that formed the basis for the development opportunity areas on maps 6A, B, and C. The more narrowly defined maps, 1 through 5, reflect projects either proposed or currently in development. One map was an outlier of where the town would like to see development, but where no prospect is currently being proposed, and it's my area, and that area has a particular problem with parking, so we've seen many, many retail establishments leave. Um, our associate town council did a Westlaw computer search on municipal proposals that had been approved and noted that there were many variations. Um, the Ben Franco, the Board of Selectmen um, member of the town's licensing committee, ran a single model by the legislative staff, not based on anything more than a best guess of what might be approved at the State House. No other potentially more flexible and more town favorable models were shown to joint committee staff. The Public Safety Subcommittee, by contrast, held three public hearings because we wanted to get more clarity on an issue that is quite complicated when you get into the weeds and also to make sure that there was adequate public input. Um, you've heard about the research that we did through um, ELISA. Somerville got 65 licenses that are uh, attached to commercial or development areas. They even got some that were citywide, but they didn't met, put half of them attached to fixed parcels. Um, we made several recommendations, but we're told but those recommendations, the subcommittee that I chair, made recommendations to the full advisory committee, but they failed for two reasons. One was, as Elisa said, that we weren't, it was beyond the scope, according to the moderator, to shift fix to the more general licenses. And also, perhaps more to the point, because we were told that the proposal had essentially already been shown to the staff of the joint committee at the State House, and that we should simply recommend it at as presented, which leads me to a question why we even had a public process if in the end we were urged to change nothing. So, so um, I, I, can, I, I totally agree with Elise's comments who spoke to the legal counsel um, at the Joint Committee on Consumer One Protection minute. and Professional Licensure. <clears throat> and I do hope that not only do um, does the town work well with um, the State House on crafting something that gives the town much more flexibility than we have chosen? Um, we have really handcuffed ourselves in this proposal. But also to take heart and, and take into consideration the public input that we did provide through our vetting system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Hi, I'm Debbie Miller. I'm the Executive Director of the Brookline Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber wholeheartedly um, supports the effort to, um, to, to petition the state for additional liquor license in Brookline. At our September meeting, this was unanimously voted. Um, innovative restaurants keep our town business districts vibrant. And without the opportunities to offer liquor license, new restaurants naturally will not want to come to Brookline. Given that retailers here and all over the country now are very challenged on all different kinds of fronts, uh, we need to do whatever we can to support our business districts. So we urge you to please um, support this effort. I will say that our vote was taken in September prior to some of these issues that have come up so we, we haven't discussed these issues at length, but certainly the bottom line stays the same, that we, we feel that there's a great need for the liquor license. In terms of how we go about doing this, um, perhaps there needs to be some further discussion. 
Thank you. Mr. Doggett, then we'll take some questions from the floor. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, John Doggett, Precinct 13. Um, the town is out of liquor licenses. With no liquor licenses in town, the town is unable to attract new restaurants to our commercial areas and potentially encourages a secondary market for licenses. This article in The Globe last week on the Cambridge Licensing Commission was a story headlined, scores of Cambridge restaurants paid six figures for liquor license, others got them for free. We need more liquor licenses that can be issued and administered in a fair fashion. We do not need a secondary market problems that plague Cambridge. Article, Article 9 authorizes the Board of Selectmen to pursue additional licenses from the state legislature through our home rule petition. <coughs> the main motion outlines their strategy for 40 additional licenses. What the Select Board is asking for is authorization to negotiate, to start discussions on a broad basis as reasonably possible. Their starting offer is for 40 licenses. The legislature may well give us less. We should not be negotiating with ourselves by proposing less, we go in with less. And we should, I believe, not try to micromanage the negotiation. The Select Board has spoken with the Legislative Committee concerned and has received indications that our proposal is in line with what they usually grant. There's only six or seven months left in the legislative calendar to get this through. Some amongst us liked what Somerville did. Somerville asked and eventually got more flexibility. It took them 17 months. We, cannot just, we just cannot afford that amount of time for a more risky, flexible approach as it rules out improbable deferment and then lack of licenses for the foreseeable future. We need to expedite the process and get favorable passage to the legislature in short order. The select board should be given as much runway as possible to negotiate a good deal. Please vote for favorable action on Article 9. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Margolis. John Margolis, Precinct 7. Uh, I think this is a question probably for the selectmen or select people. Um, I'd like to know, first of all, what was the reasoning behind the idea of attaching so many of these licenses, licenses to specific parcels? And related to that, how the parcels to get these uh, very valuable gifts were selected? Mr. Franco? Ben Franco for the Board of Selectmen. This proposal was developed several months ago based on feedback we received from uh, municipal councils around the state who have gone through this process uh, through conversations with legislative staff uh, and um, a review of, uh, of successful uh, uh, petitions to the legislature. Uh, and based on the feedback we received in the document review that we conducted, um, we concluded that uh, having a split uh, two bucket system, one with specific uh, addresses called out and the second with more general uh, what we term development opportunity areas was the correct approach. That was an approach validated by, uh, by again by municipal councils who have gone through this process, uh, validated by conversations with uh, legislative staff and uh, through a review uh, of uh, petitions that have passed in, in the past couple of years. I do want to highlight that um, some of the confusion about the message that we received, we the town received, when drafting this petition based on some of the more recent feedback, uh, I think partly is due to a change in the chairmanship of the House side of the committee. Um, in uh, in uh, July, I believe, of this year, there was a shakeup in terms of House leadership with the, uh, the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee leaving the legislature, uh, going into the private sector, uh, and our very own uh, Representative Sanchez was elevated. Uh, that sparked a cascade uh, of leadership changes, uh, including to the, uh, the chairmanship of the, the Joint Committee uh, on uh, Professional Licensure. Uh, and the current chair, uh, I believe, has a little bit of a different outlook. So uh, we are uh, having a little bit of a mixed message here based on uh, a change in outlook, uh, based on change in personnel. Uh, I commit to you that uh, we will go to the, the, uh, the legislature uh, and try and get as much flexibility as possible to get the best possible deal for the town. But in order to do that, we need to pass this article tonight. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Judith Vanderkay, uh, town meeting member, precinct nine and library trustee. 
I have a couple of questions. Uh, possibly they are to the select ones. Um, th that's always been my favorite term anyway. Um, first of all, um, what is wrong with what I believe is our traditional system of taking each license application on its own merits? And my second question is, how can the town justify unilaterally uh, raising the value of a specific parcel, um, especially when uh, a number of these parcels are under the same ownership, that is Chestnut Hill Realty, and others of the parcels, as far as I know, um, one of them being my veterinary uh, office and another being my uh, car mechanic and a third being Brookline Ice and Coal, as far as I know, there are no active uh, developments going on there. Yet, these, um, the owners of these parcels are being handed a gift, as other people have mentioned, that will increase the value of their property and enable them to charge higher rents to uh, tenants who, who may come in and, and wish to occupy them. Mr. Franco. Uh, let me uh, take your questions in order. First, uh, there would be no change to the procedure for issuing licenses. Each applicant uh, would be judged on the merits of their application for, for a liquor license. What we're talking about here is having the ability to issue that liquor license. You're talking about the second stage in the issuance process. We don't have anything in the, in the hopper, in the queue, that would allow us to, um, to issue a license to an applicant. As yes, but, but if you put a license on a parcel, then that gives that landlord, that owner, uh, a benefit. So that takes us to your second question. Uh, let me first say that uh, I think you're talking about with ice and coal and the, your veterinary uh, um, clinic and your, your mechanic. That's uh, River Road. We, uh, this body a year ago, uh, approved a, a massive uh, special district for that, uh, that, um, that part of town. Uh, it is true that there is only one development proposal that has come in thus far, uh, but I think it was the hope of this body, again, 12 months ago, that there'd be future development occurring in that location over the next several years. How did we select these parcels that we called out for specific uh, licenses? Uh, again, they were based on uh, projects that had been uh, approved, uh, that were underway in terms of construction, or were contemplated. This is a proposal that tries to take the long view about where development is going to occur over the next 15, 20 years, uh, and make sure that there are licenses uh, available uh, should restaurants uh, choose to locate in those areas. Again, we, we were told when we wrote this, we drafted this proposal uh, six plus months ago that this was the way we had to do it. This was the format that the legislature liked to see, a split of specific call-outs of, of properties and more general opportunity areas. And I can share with you some of the communities that have followed that model. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on the Somerville uh, model, but uh, we, we adopted a, uh, the model that was successful for the, uh, the city of Medford, and there are others that follow that model as well. Um, I'll allow that motion. Uh, I have the uh, only Mr. Saner left, and my apologies, Mr. Saner, uh, on the speakers list. And you see Ms. Frawley, Ms. DeWitt, I saw Mr. Bassett, Mr. Feingold, Ms. Granoff, and Ms. Bernard at the microphones with questions or comments. Uh, nevertheless, I'll allow the motion for the question. Is there a second? All those, it takes a two-thirds vote. Uh, those in favor of terminating debate, moving the question, please raise your hands. Those opposed, motion fails. Mr. Saner. Paul Saner, Precinct 13, co-chair of EDAB. You've heard, thank you, Mel. You've heard the expression, perfection is the enemy of the good. I think this applies here. Can I get some time back? 
<laughs> you got it. Paul Sainer, Precinct 13, co-chair of EDAB. You've heard the expression, perfection is the enemy of the good. I think that that's very applicable here under the circumstances. First, with respect to Mr. Davis's suggestion that we come back at a future town meeting. We may very well have to do that if we miss the opportunity uh, within this two-year legislative session, which is almost halfway through. So if town meeting votes favorably today, then we need to um, get this moving out of committee by February of next year in order for it to have a chance to pass uh, within the legislative session. Um, it would be pointless to defer this to May uh, since um, there would be no way that this would be um, taken up by the legislature. If we miss this window, then we'll absolutely be back here next November. You heard reference uh, by Mr. Doggett to Somerville's experience took 17 months. So if you were to vote with Mr. Davis, you're voting for a two to three year uh, hole in liquor licenses meaning the next legislative session starts January of 19, and if we follow the Somerville experience, we'll be well into 20 before we have any additional licenses. I want to applaud the due diligence that was done uh, by, in particular, um, Ms. Khan and Ms. Jonas. Uh, it was very illuminating. There's additional due diligence that I want to share with you. Yesterday, Associate Counsel, uh, Patty Correa did speak to the general counsel of the Joint Committee, and she read to him the savings language at the end of our petition, and I'll quote it. The general court may make changes within the scope of the general public objectives of this petition. Now, it seems that they have a different view of within scope than our esteemed Mr. Moderator. Um, Ms. Correa reported back to um, uh, Selectman Franco and myself that we can change anything, including eliminating or reducing the number of site-specific licenses, which as I've gone through this process, I question uh, the wisdom of having that many. You heard um, reference to the 10,000 villages uh, retail storefront on Harvard Street. And uh, the recent turnover there and a couple of restaurateurs wanting to go in. What do we have there now? We have a lovely brokerage office with a couple of desks in the window. I don't think that that's adding vitality to our commercial areas um, or life uh, in the evenings. Um, restaurants are a huge economic dr uh, driver uh, for this town. Uh, and uh, there are many reasons, uh, including attracting outsiders to spend money in our commercial areas, uh, the local meals tax. Um, so um, there is clearly a lot of uh, differences over what best foot a municipality should set forth when following a petition like this. And I want to expand upon Mr. Franco's comments. I spoke to uh, a very well-regarded uh, senior aide of a state senator who told me it wasn't so long ago that um, the um, joint committee's attitude was, leave it up to the municipalities, we don't want any specifics. And then they did a 180, down to the level of, we'd really like to see specific properties identified. You heard um, uh, Selectman Franco reference uh, the new chair of the House side of the Joint Committee, Representative Tacky Chen. And um, we understand, based upon the conversation uh, that was held yesterday, that he really wants uh, the town to um, ask for what they want. So you have we one have minute. a completely one minute, open, thank you, we have a completely open-ended negotiation um, the um, scoping language uh, is not going to restrict our ability to come back with the best possible outcome for the town. So I urge you uh, to please vote favorable action on the selectman's motion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sainer. And I might comment that the standards that I bring to bear in determining scope issues may differ substantially from those uh, prevailing in the legislature. Ms. Frawley. 
Thank you. Regina Frawley from Precinct 16. I read that article about Cambridge licenses and it's not how it was presented tonight. The issue was not whether people had to pay for licenses that others didn't have to pay. That was the reason the article was written, not that it, the way it was presented, and that's significant. And the licensing authority feels it doesn't have any obligation to inform people how to go about getting one of the free licenses. Thank you, that's one point. Point two, you don't negotiate by signing a blank check and then negotiate. This could have been done before the fact, ready for tonight, and we could have, we many of us have tried to get the the site specific things removed because the old process of having each petitioner come and request that allows the neighborhood to come and express its reasons for why they support it or don't support it. They're the only ones who know the impact in that particular area. So we're doing. If cliches are, are acceptable, we're putting the cart before the horse and we shouldn't do that. Thank you. Well, Ms. Farley, I think you heard Mr. Uh, Franco say that the uh, petitions process will, be, will not be affected by, uh, by the words and form of this uh, request. Ms. DeWitt? I think Mr. Sainer may have answered my question, but well, I'd like, sorry, Betsy DeWitt, town meeting member, precinct five. Um, it may be that he's answered my question, which really is that, in my opinion, uh, having submitted a similar article um, several years ago, which was rejected, this one doesn't look that different to me, um, and my concerns then, as they are now, is that it's flat out discriminatory, and I would have thought the license holders might bring court action because they aren't being treated equally. What we've got now are portable licenses. It's a, no, it's a private negotiation between the license holder, but the town has the authority to approve the license, not the address and so the license can be taken from one location to another. Now, what I'm really trying to find out is this. Since what Mr. Sainer says suggested that there is an opportunity for negotiating at the legislature, I want to know, are we bound by this vote? Because if we are, I don't see how we can negotiate with the legislature. So somebody tell me. I'd prefer not to be bound, but I will not vote for it if I am. <clears throat> Good evening, <clears throat> Patty Correa, First Assistant Town Council. <clears throat> so Mr. Sainer had read the savings language at the end of the Warren article, which is very broad and flexible. And the general counsel for the joint committee listened to me read it to him and said that this there is no obstacle to the legislature changing the language in coordination with the town because of how that language reads. Thank you, Mr. Question. Feingold. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm gonna go in, in reverse order here. Well, uh, why don't you tell us who you are first? I'm so sorry, uh, Joel Feingold, uh, town meeting member, precinct one. Uh, going in reverse order, I think there's uh, some misunderstanding about how licensing works. What we're doing right now is giving the town the authority to go to the legislature and get new licenses which the town will then control. Those licenses then get issued to applicants who want to open a restaurant. And those will, at that point, and legal jump in if I'm wrong, that means if a restaurant's in one location and they want to move, they're going to come back to the town and say, I'm moving and I need approval to operate my business now in this location. So I think that's how that works, which I believe will satisfy one of the other town meeting members. Um, uh, toward another point which was made, which is, is, is that correct, by the way? Patty Correa, town council. That's correct with regard to quota licenses. With regard to special legislation, um, the petitions that have passed successfully have language such as ours in paragraphs D and E, which was copied from Somerville. Well, I think Mr. Feingold's question was, uh, 
if a restaurant with a license changes location, do they or do they not have to come back before the board of selectmen? Yes, in, in either event, in either event, but there are restrictions on transfer in our warrant. <coughs> excuse me, in our warrant article for the above coital licenses. Thank you. Uh, then the next uh, point, which I heard a number of people mention, is concern over whether uh, about licenses which had been identified as particular to certain lots. And uh, uh, I would suggest that that's an excellent mechanism for the town to use to signal to developers and entrepreneurs that we're open to development in those areas. It's a good way for us to guide the development that we want and to encourage restaurateurs to open in locations which we think are suitable. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at those uh, lots which have been identified as giveaways or problems. Someone's going to own them. It doesn't, you know, from that standpoint, uh, uh, it, you can't change that, whether it's Charles River Realty or, or me. You can't, someone's going to own those lots, and they happen to be in the spot where, by good fortune or good planning, uh, they have an opportunity to improve, uh, you know, their, their profit. The last thing I would say is that the same uh, concern was what had driven me uh, toward my amendment, which is an overly broad portion of uh, the original article, which to me was the first signal that maybe Brookline at some point now, far in the future, might be amenable to development in areas where I would certainly fight it tooth and nail. All of this said, in order for Brookline to stay the lively town that it is, we need the commercial development, we want the restaurants, and I strongly urge you to pass this article. Ms. Granoff, uh, we'll hear from Ms. Granoff and then I'll take that motion. Thank you. Susan Granoff, Precinct 7. I too wanted some legal clarification of paragraphs D and E. D says expressly, once issued, the licensing authority shall not approve the transfer of the licenses to any other location but it may grant the licenses to new applicants at the same location. That seems to me that that's going to be creating financial windfalls to a small number of landlords who not only will be able to charge much greater rents, but virtually overnight their properties will increase dramatically in value. This I think might create a situation where there'll be a great deal of pressure and inducements placed on the licensing authority and on selectmen and anyone else making these decisions of where these uh, very valuable licenses are granted. And I fear that the democracy that we value so much might be threatened by the possibility or the appearance of corruption. Additionally, item E says that the license terminates if it is no longer in use, which would seem to me that if a particular uh, license or a, a rental property is being used for one particular restaurant or bar and over time there's a need for a different sort of development that the owner of that license would jeopardize the financial value of that license if they permit it to fall into disuse. This could ossify and restrict our development to follow specific patterns once those licenses are granted. So I'm concerned that unintentionally, the wording of paragraphs D and E, which apparently were adopted from some other uh, town's application, might put us as a town into a situation that we don't want to be in because we value an openness and a transparency. And this is going to create a lot of pressure because of the creation of such valuable financial uh, licenses. So thank you. Do you wish to respond to that, Mr. Franco? I want to make sure that everybody understands that there is no right to a license. Uh, it can be restricted to a particular address, but that does not mean that as of right, 
an applicant gets the license. It, they still have to go through a hearing before the Board of Selectmen, and it still has to be uh, approved by the, uh, the state level Alcoholic Con Beverage Control Commission. Uh, if a restaurant closes, um, that license uh, uh, would have to, um, the new applicant at the same address. So let's say that there's a restaurant that's operating, then it closes and a new restaurant opens at the same address. The new applicant would still need to return to the Board of Selectmen and get approval to uh, continue to utilize that license. Um, to your second point, the, the point about paragraph E, uh, there are uh, regulations that the Board of Selectmen has adopted uh, and that uh, the service of alcohol in this town operates under. For example, and I think this is most relevant to paragraph E, you can't apply for a license, receive it, and then not serve alcohol at an establishment. You can't warehouse a license. Right. So what paragraph E uh, um, <coughs> contemplates is such warehousing of a license and says if that happens, if they, the, the applicant isn't utilizing the license or they lose it for whatever other reason, over service, uh, failure to, uh, to abide by TIP certifications, onward and, and, and so forth, uh, that license would return to the town and the town would have the ability to, to issue it to a subsequent applicant. Are you saying that if someone, uh, if, if someone who uh, has a restaurant in a specific property, that the property, the attachment of the license is to that address, that restaurateur moves someplace else, that person can't take the license they've been granted with them, they'd have to reapply. But the owner of the restaurant would be able to, uh, the owner of the property where the restaurant was, could rent it out to a different restaurateur. That, correct, the license itself resides with the landlord and not with the person. No. No? A landlord does not own a liquor license. It, it resides with the property. Uh, it is only eligible for issuance to a certain property, but it is not held by anybody. Right. Liquor licenses are the property of the town of Brookline. Okay, but, but when you say it's held by a specific property, who designates who, who can utilize that property other than the landlord? Who, they will make the choice who they rent to, correct? That's correct, but the Board of Selectmen is the licensing authority in the town decides who gets the liquor license. I see. So okay. with the Board no, I'm just going off. I, I okay. think we've had enough of uh, this debate. And I'll take the motion for the question. Is there a second? Requires a two-thirds vote. Those in favor, uh, you see the, uh, I have no one else on the speaker's list. You see who's at the microphones. Uh, those in favor of calling the question and terminating debate, please raise your hands. Those opposed, motion carries by a two-thirds vote. On the motion on page, pages one through three of the yellow supplement, those in favor, please raise your hands. Those opposed, motion carries by a majority vote. We move now since we deferred the Chestnut Hill articles to Article 16, and the only motion before us is a motion to refer, which if you'll turn to the pink supplement page, let's see. <clears throat> Yeah, the uh, orange, I guess this is orange, supplement page eight, there is a motion to refer at the, at the end of the text uh, that we will change because it's uh, unanimously being, being put forward by uh, the uh, relevant parties here. Uh, change the word committee on town organization structure to board of selectmen and change the words committee to to the word they so that the motion reads to refer the subject matter of article 16 to the board of selectmen and to request that they re present a report to the may 2018 annual town meeting that's moved by Mr. Gordon, seconded by Ms. Ms. Hamilton. 
Question of the wording, sir? A board is an it, not a they. Yeah, I'm sorry. The, the, it should just be the selectmen. Uh, and that's the, way, that, that's the way it was given to me, so uh, my mistake. So the motion to refer, thank you for that grammatical lesson, Ms. Farley. Uh, motion is to refer the subject of matter of Article 16 to the selectmen and to request that they present a report to the May 2018 annual town meeting. Moved by Mr. Gordon, seconded by Ms. Hamilton. Mr. Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Neil Gordon, town meeting member, Precinct 1, a co-chair with Marty Rosenthal of Brookline PAX. The World Wide Web was invented in 1989, 28 years ago. The first web browser was released to the public in 1991. Amazon was founded in 1994. 16 years after the start of the internet as we know it, that's 10 years ago, and with the general urging of Brookline PAX, town meeting took bold and visionary action, amending the town's bylaws by adding section 3.21 to require this, paraphrasing from the bylaw. In addition to posting a paper copy, each meeting notice required by the open meeting law shall be posted in electronic format as soon as is practicable on the town website calendar. The bylaw continues, to the extent possible, each posting shall include if you're ready for this, an agenda to the extent possible. Ten years ago, town meeting voted favorable action on what we now take totally and completely for granted, the posting of meeting notices, agendas, and records on the town's website. With that as an introduction, welcome to the fall of 2017, Warren Article 16, and once again, the general urging of PACs at the podium. Petitioning town meeting for an expansion of section 3.21 of the general bylaws. Because 26 years after the start of the internet as we know it, it's past the time we do so. In promoting article 16, PACS proposed that we further enhance public access to pertinent documents that relate to <coughs> issues of known public concern. Because doing so encourages meaningful citizen participation in town government. Article 16 proposed including, within electronic meeting notices, the very same documents that are distributed to members of our boards, committees, and commissions, documents that are relevant to the meetings of those bodies, and as I said, documents that relate to issues of known public concern. There were many cooks on this one. The advisory committee, the selectmen, and the committee on town government and structure all met separately to discuss and weigh in on Article 16. At one point, each of those bodies voted to recommend favorable action on its own version. There was no disagreement in principle, that is, on the broad issue of providing relevant, pertinent information to the public. Rather, it was devilish details. What documents should be posted? Documents distributed electronically, available electronically, or those that could, without undue effort, be made available electronically. Who will be responsible for the posting? Committee chairs who are in possession of the documents and can best determine what's pertinent, or town staff with easy access to the town software systems and the skills necessary to use them? What final tweaks could be made to one version or another as the clock ticked down to town meeting and we tried to craft a consensus motion? Each of the motions that might have come before you fell short in one way or another. The various somewhat independent efforts came close, some closer than others, and each standing alone would have represented a worthwhile start, a start that would have, with modest effort, provided the public, that would be us, readily available information they need, we need, to fully participate in our town government. But as the clock ran out, there was, and there is, no consensus motion. The petitioners believe that further effort, further input, and further review will yield a better solution than we might have achieved in what became hurried fashion. I encourage you to vote favorable action on the motion to refer the subject matter of Article 16 to the selectmen. Thank you. And you should uh, breathe a collective sigh of relief that you didn't have to wade your way through three 
uh, competing versions of this motion. Ms. Hamilton, for, sorry. Good evening. Uh, Heather Hamilton for a unanimous board of selectmen. We would, like to, we would like you to refer this to the selectmen so they can be studied further and a report presented at town meeting in the spring. Please vote favorable action on the motion to refer. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. DeWitt. I'm Betsy DeWitt, town meeting member, precinct five, but uh, I'm now speaking for the town, the committee on town organization and structure. Um, we, as you've heard, discussed the uh, elements of this proposal and are in full agreement with its intent and had some practical concerns and I'm just gonna briefly outline uh, specifically, we, and there's some language that is uh, part of the, what was submitted, but also a need, there is a need to update the language that is currently in place. And because it's a bylaw, it's not a resolution, we felt that these things all needed to have careful, thoughtful attention. Um, but we're in total agreement that we should have public information, transparency, and, and good access. Um, the specific er concerns that we had are that not all information to a town body is provided in electronic form. Therefore, those documents must be manually converted. Some documents are physically large, physically big, like uh, architectural plans. Others are multi-page bound documents um, and brochures. And we don't know if you can always require an electronic version. Uh, not all town committees are staffed. And most particularly, accessing the town's website for posting is currently limited to employees and is therefore not offered, it's not available to a volunteer committee chair. Um, on the technical side, there was no language exempting confidential documents um, and there are other uh, language that needed to be updated and corrected to be consistent with state statute. We believe that the matter of getting documents into the public is of high priority and it should be done. But we also think, and I would put my own personal request here, that whoever studies this, and we will be in support of referral, develops a checklist that every committee chair has, which says, here are the steps that you must take or can take, and this is how you get your document for your activity, whatever it is, posted. And in order to do this, we believe that the group, whoever it is who takes this on, should consult with town staff, um, make sure we touch base with our attorneys on the matter of making sure language is correctly updated so that we don't have um, oh, Scrivener's errors or omissions. Um, I'm speaking for myself now because CTONS did not have an opportunity to meet, but since we are in very much in support of the goals of this, uh, I personally would recommend favorable action on the vote to refer. Mr. Benka, <clears throat> you have a minute and a half. Thank you. Uh, Dick Benka, a minute and a half for the Committee on Town Organization and Structure. Since you've already had, we've already had three and a half minutes, is that? I understand. Um, CTO and S was presented with a number of motions and uh, there were a number of concerns that we had. Um, some of the facts uh, that uh, came to our attention is the fact that uh, non-employees such as committee chairs do not have access to the town's website. They simply cannot post documents on the town's website. Uh, the uh, proposals that we saw did not distinguish between a committee that was supported by staff and, that w and committees that were not supported by staff. Uh, the language of the proposals uh, looked to whether uh, a conversion of uh, documents not provided in electronic form to electronic form was feasible, and our concern was that the word feasible in the original proposals, uh, the dictionary definition meant capable of being converted to electronic form, which is virtually any document. 
Um, the original motions also permitted penalties of, of up to $50 per day for non-posting that theoretically could have been assigned to or uh, uh, imposed against volunteer committee chairs. And finally, last but not least, uh, the proposals did not protect documents that were immune from disclosure under the open meeting law, the public records law, or by virtue of the attorney-client privilege or any other immunity or privilege that would prevent discovery. And this was an issue that was of particular concern to CTONS given the possibility of litigation on a number of fronts uh, that we see on the horizon. So while there's no official vote of CTONS on the referral motion that is before you, taking a breather through referral is certainly consistent with the CTONS advice uh, that the issues that I've outlined and more be addressed more carefully. Thank you. Yeah, I apologize, Mr. Carroll. Did you want to address the uh, motion to refer one way or another? Yeah, I'm Frank Carroll, Precinct 10. I, I, I want to speak, uh, speak to this as, uh, as uh, a chair of a, of a couple of volunteer committees, uh, one the age-friendly, co-chair of the Age-Friendly City Committee and chair of the recently formed uh, Pedestrian Advisory Committee. I mean, these are both, both uh, uh, committees that are staffed by volunteers. I just want to call to your attention the fact that we are already having difficulty in complying with what we are already committed. I mean, and it seems, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it seems, you know, kind of in the abstract, it's, um, uh, I mean, it's mind-boggling uh, that, uh, in, in fact, we have some difficulties in, uh, sometimes, in getting uh, meetings posted uh, on uh, on the town website or agendas posted on the uh, town website and we find ourselves in situations where we're not certain that we're actually able to meet uh, you know there's an, uh, there's an agenda uh, but it, it didn't get on the, on the website and I, I think we need to be very careful uh, about uh, going forward with another obligation of this kind uh, but just because of the, the complexities of implementation I mean, it's very well intentioned, but uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the negative consequences for those of us who are working with committees and trying to make things work and, uh, you know, complying with some of these technic technicalities uh, may be, uh, in some instances, really counterproductive. So I, I really urge caution with this. Thank you. Mr. Sandman. So uh, I'd like to have the slide up, uh, please. And uh, who are you? I uh, beg your pardon. Uh, Mike Sandman, um, town meeting member, uh, precinct three, advisory committee, speaking for the advisory committee. And uh, we do have a slide before the uh, slide comes up. I just want to mention that um, my colleague Carla Benka, who maintains a level of public service that really dazzles the, uh, the rest of us, became a grandmother a few minutes ago, as did <laughs> and her Husband Dick became a uh, grandfather, and uh, yet here they are sitting in, uh, in town meeting. And so, as I say, we're, we're dazzled. Um, the advisory committee commi uh, considered uh, uh, Article 16 five times, five times. Uh, after time number four, Mr. Lynn Jones did a masterful job of rewriting our recommendation, uh, which was for referral uh, to CTO and S. And then came reconsideration vote number five, uh, reconsideration and vote number five, a motion to refer uh, to the yet-to-be-renamed Board of Selectmen. Um, as Mr. Lynn Jones reminded me, Winston Churchill said, Americans can always be counted on to do the right thing after exhausting all other alternatives. <laughs> so, um, there we go. All right, so I think it, it's just appropriate to give you a sense of what this is about. Um, and what the original concept is so that uh, whatever emerges from uh, the Board of Selectmen will have some familiarity to you. Um, and basically, uh, I'm not going to read this thing, but uh, you, can, you can probably all uh, read it, most of you are Brookline High graduates. Um, the idea is to, that there are documents that are circulated to the members of public bodies 
um, that are uh, useful for the public to see uh, and uh, in order to decide whether or not the issue that's being considered is something that they want to comment on. And so uh, the petition has put this, uh, this concept together um, and uh, among other things we had long discussions about well what documents should be circulated, who should have uh, discretion to decide what that should be and whether documents that were provided not in electronic format but in paper form needed to be scanned. And you can see the intent anyway, even though the language didn't necessarily match that intent. Um, I said that we considered this five times. We uh, asked 50 plus committees, boards, and, uh, and commissions for comments, and we received five. Um, one said yes, one said no. Um, one gave us some very useful remarks, but they weren't directly related. And then we had very helpful comments from uh, Melissa Goff, uh, the um, Assistant Town Administrator, and Allison Steinfeld, Director of uh, Planning and Community Development. And then after, long after the deadline for our, for our comments had, had expired, CTO and S came in, um, which was irritating, but damn it, they were good comments, very useful. And so we had to reconsider it yet again. Uh, and uh, then uh, after the uh, fourth time, the Board of Selectmen uh, then weighed in and asked us to consider it the fifth time because uh, they would prefer that the article be, um, uh, and the petitioners, I believe, would prefer that the article be uh, referred to the Selectmen, which the uh, Advisory Committee uh, endorses unanimously. Mr. Rosenthal. Okay, Ms. Smith. Well, I have only one more speaker. It's Kim, Ms. Smith, if she wishes to speak. She's good. Okay. <clears throat> On the motion to refer to the, to the selectmen, uh, those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. Motion. All right. Those in favor, please raise your hands. Those opposed, Please stand. <laughs> Motion carries by a vote of 160 to 3. <laughs> All right, we move now to Article 17. No motion is offered under Article 17 which brings us to Articles 18 and 19, which will be de debated together. <clears throat> uh, the main motion under Article 18 is on page 18-3. It's the motion of the advisory committee, which has uh, been consented to and endorsed by the petitioner, Mr. Burstein. Uh, that motion is moved by Mr. Burstein, seconded by Mr. Gordon. Uh, it would have us amend both the general and zoning bylaw by substituting select board for board of selectmen and <coughs> select board member for selectmen and the various variations of that. Uh, is the board of selectmen still... Uh, intent on it's the select person oh, yeah. oh wonderful all right the uh, <coughs> the uh, selectman mr. Wyshynski seconded by Ms. Hamilton uh, would move to substitute the motion on page 18-2, uh, which differs in one significant respect, and that is by calling the selectmen uh, select persons instead of select board members, a very weighty issue. Uh, we will take that as a substitute motion, which means it's in the form of an amendment if you pass it then the main motion as amended and substituted will be voted on again. Okay, in Article 19, the, motions, uh, the motion is a resolution found on 
uh, and, and there'll be two votes under 18, one uh, for the zoning bylaw, which changes, which have to require a two-thirds vote, and the second on the general bylaws, which require only a majority vote. On Article 19, the motion is on page 19-5, and uh, do the selectmen concur with that, or are you still being obstreperous? Okay. okay. All right. A point Select of order, Mr. Moderator. What's that? Um, the selectmen substitute motion, which would include select persons instead of select board members, would that also include the final clause that refers to regulations, contracts, agreements, and other documents? Well, uh, that's a very good point because that's outside the scope of Article 18. So you have to delete that language, uh, whether you like it or not. <clears throat> and um, on Article 19, um, please apologize for the chair. I apologize for the chair's. Uh, confusion about this, but I didn't think we'd really get to these articles tonight. Uh, Article 19, and there was always some hope that the selectmen would reconcile with what the petitioners wanted with these articles, uh, which they have failed to do. So, um, <clears throat> again, the selectmen move a, an alternate resolution found on pages 19 2 and 3. Uh, the um, advisory committees is on page 19-5, moved by Mr. Gordon and seconded by Mr. Lynn Jones, and uh, the selectman's version is on 19-2 and 3, moved by Mr. Wyshynski and seconded by Ms. Hamilton. So, I call on Mr. Burstein. And Mr. Coleman, would you please come forward? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael A. Burstein, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 12. Um, I was not expecting to address this tonight, so I'll try to keep this brief as possible. Um, I just want to, I will start by saying that I do, in fact, support uh, the advisory committee motion uh, of the language that has been presented. Uh, I support the phrase select board member. Uh, apologies to the current selectman for that. I prefer that to select persons. That said, my eight-year-old twin daughters prefer select Tron for what that's worth. Um, I do want to talk, though, briefly about the thing that was most controversial about this. Why did I choose to file a warrant article suggesting the change to Board of Select Women, which I think all of us know did, in fact, generate quite a bit of press outside of Brookline. Um, I did expect others to propose the gender neutral language and I wanted to demonstrate through this mirror as it were why I thought it was important to change the term selectman to be more inclusive. Um, when I saw that people were rejecting gender neutral language from the outset I knew that proposing gender switch language would make it easier for them to understand. Um, a few people thought that, or at least one person thought I was making a mockery of the system. I'd like to assure you that this is not so. I was serious about the proposal. Had the advisor committee and the board of selectmen supported the language I originally proposed. Uh, if town meeting, somebody out there wants to move my original proposal, um, it would, I think it would be bold. It would make an important point about how we refer to ourselves in town government. But I think the important point here is the fact that there's nothing inherent in our gender expression when it comes to our roles as elected members of town government. But the reason I decided to go with that phrase, select women, is because women are woefully underrepresented in elected positions, not only in Massachusetts, but throughout the entire United States. Um, thank you. In June, the Boston Globe reported that in Massachusetts there were 97 municipalities out of all 351 cities and towns, 97 of them have no women serving in elected positions. There are in Massachusetts 1,781 mayors, city councilors, aldermen, and selectmen positions. Only 430 of those offices are held by women, 24%. Go take a look at other things. Look at the federal government. Our House of Representatives is 19.3% women. Our Senate is 20 women, 20%. Our Supreme Court has only three women out of nine. Look at the executive branch of state government. Do you know how many governors of all 50 states are women? 
I was very surprised to find at the moment it's only six. And sadly, as I think we're all aware, this country has never had a woman serving as president. Um, I made the proposal I did because I thought this was very important. Um, and I especially have noticed over the past month, I think we've seen how important it is for women and for anyone of any gender, wherever they fall on the gender spectrum, to be accepted as a human being. We've been seeing these revelations of harassment in Hollywood. We saw an article by Yvonne Abraham in the Boston Globe about harassment in the Massachusetts State House. Um, I, I don't think I need to go on about that. I do want to point out that when we go with this gender neutral language, Brookline would not be the first town to adopt this. About 30 other communities in Massachusetts have done so. They have their own select boards serving as the head of their executive branches. Um, the language we use may not determine thought, but it does contribute to what we view as possible. Uh, I do want to uh, give a special thanks to Alex Coleman. Um, Alex filed Article 19 that presented that gender neutral option explicitly for the Board of Selectmen and paved the way for the Advisor Committee and Board of Selectmen to propose uh, this motion, which is technically under Article 18, but Article 19 is also in the same spirit of it. I'd like to thank the Advisor Committee and the Board of Selectmen for taking this issue seriously and endorsing the idea that the time has come for this gender neutral language in our town. Uh, and I do hope that all of you in town meeting will agree. Um, as Rabbi Hillel once said, if not now, when? Thank you. <clears throat> Is um, Alex Coleman here? Okay, uh, Mr. Gordon. And Mr. Narrow, please come forward. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Neil Gordon, uh, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 1, speaking on behalf of the Advisory Committee. The motion supported by the Advisory Committee on Article 18 would amend the town's general and zoning bylaws, renaming the Board of Selectmen as the Select Board and otherwise referring to members of that body as exactly that, members. Members, it's perfectly suitable, descriptive, plain English. Titles, what we actually call the members, do not need to be prescribed by a bylaw. Titles would be free to evolve over time as the town and the broader community decide by practice and without a need for periodic bylaw amendments as we decide, change, and evolve. By a vote of 16 in favor, three opposed, and one abstention, the advisory committee recommends favorable action on its motion on Article 18. Article 19 is presented as a resolution. In summary, it asks for two things. First, that in lieu of a wholesale rewriting of countless town documents, that we just take the old terms to mean the new terms whenever we encounter them. And second, that the town strive to use gender neutral language were appropriate and practicable in documents and communications pertaining to the business of the town. It's both appropriate and practicable that we do so the advisory committee, by a vote of 29 in favor, three opposed, and with one abstention, recommends favorable action on Article 19. What was the count again on that vote? 29? To th there are only 30 members of the advisory committee. Wait, wait, what did I say? You've got what a couple I, of extra members in there. Uh, Mr. 19, Narrow? 19, sorry. 19 okay. in favor, three right. opposed, one abstention. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 20 minutes? <laughs> uh, try to. <laughs> um, moderator, members of the board, advisory committee, members, and uh, town meeting. Um, I'm proud to speak on behalf of- Who are you? I'm, I was getting to that. <laughs> My name is Tony Narrow, Precinct 5, and I'm proud to speak on behalf of the Commission for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations in strong support of making another positive change in our community. Gender and gender identity are issues that have always existed in our society, yet they are difficult to talk about sometimes. It's easier not to delve into the matter and try to gain a full and complete understanding, but rather to just go on with our lives, business as usual, all the while people in our community suffer and they feel without a place and they feel excluded. Every day, Brookline is becoming a more inclusive and welcoming town 
we not only have the benefit of having a board that all members I can say supports such efforts we also have a community which you all represent that wants to make Brookline the most inclusive equal and welcoming town in the Commonwealth and it's hard work and there's a lot to do and we're not always perfect at it uh, we will argue at times about how to measure progress and how to achieve success but at the end of the day we are all arguing in support of creating a space free of discrimination and one of inclusion and equality we had competing versions of war warrant article 18 and 19 whichever passed was going to be a victory in pursuit of equality for all persons regardless of identities and particularly regardless of sex or gender identity and that's a good day at town meeting in my book and it's a great way to end the first night it is the mission of the Commission for diversity inclusion and community relations to support a welcoming environment by encouraging cooperation acceptance and respect among and by all persons who come in contact with the town of Brookline by advancing promoting and advocating for the human and civil rights of all through education awareness outreach and advocacy we firmly believe that the warrant articles um, do just that um, regardless of their version and um, one thing is for certain you will be helping you will be helping especially with a unanimous vote um, promoting our Commission's mission by supporting this thank you thank you miss Hamilton Good evening, Heather Hamilton for our unanimous Board of Selectmen. The Selectmen voted to support the term select persons. The advisory committee chose to support the term select board members. I think we support select persons because it's easier to say, it's less awkward, and it seems to be the most popular term used here tonight, although we've heard them all. <laughs> um, while this is a real difference of language, I do not believe it is significant uh, difference in sentiment. I would welcome either term and would like to share a personal experience with you that can shed some light on this article's importance. When some of my friends and colleagues encouraged me to run for the board, I immediately dismissed the idea. I am disappointed by my initial reaction when I reflect back on it now. As was pointed out to me then, I was both interested and qualified. What were my reservations about running? Well, I thought some people would say I'm too young. Some would disqualify me because I don't own property. Perhaps people would hesitate to support a single woman. I have no direction, direct connection to the Brookline Public Schools. I had so many concerns about how I could be labeled as an other or someone who didn't belong. Brookline's voters proved to be supportive of me. And it's now our job to reflect this in our bylaws that Brookline is supportive of anyone who seeks to improve our community by serving on the board. While I personally have enjoyed the discourse generated by Article 18, Article 19 is crucial to the future select board because language matters. How we communicate creates perceptions that go on to shape our reality. As they say, if you can't see it, you won't be it. Just as policemen and firemen have become police officers and firefighters, this change is both more accurate and reflective of our welcoming, inclusive, and diverse community. I hope you will join me in voting yes on Article 19 as amended by the Board of Selectmen. Thank you. Mr. Doggett. <laughs> Ms. Kahn. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Janice Contemi, member from Precinct 15. Actually, I vote for Selectron. But, um, but um, I'm standing here really as a placeholder. Alex Coleman is, will be here within the next couple of minutes, and I do hope that the body would indulge him the opportunity to speak since this is really his it's, article. Um, it's after 10.30. We have no one else to speak. I'm afraid we're going to have to come to a vote, and Mr. Coleman, uh, Alex Coleman, may uh, get a, you may all may get something of a lesson from this. Now, on Article 18, <clears throat> the first thing you do is look at the selectman's motion and delete everything 
after the semicolon in the fourth line. And uh, that will be a substitute motion. We'll, we will uh, <coughs> first consider the uh, uh, amendment to the zoning bylaw, uh, actually to the substitute motion on the zoning bylaw vote only requires a majority vote. So on the selectman's motion, Mr. Oh, Goldstein. Uh, Gladstone. Gladstone. Mr. Goldstein is my cousin, but yes. still, thank you. Um, Scott Gladstone, Precinct 16. So I do have a text message from Alex Coleman. If, I, if uh, you're we're, sitting interested, we're at, I can read we're it. We're at the boat, Mr. Gladstone. Well, you hadn't um, called it yet, which is why I was hoping you might indulge it. But I will, because if, if you allowed it, I would just say that he supported the summary of Warren article and support CDICR or AC on the <coughs> 18 and 19. Thanks. So Thank you very much. AC. Thank you. If you were to allow me to speak, that's what I would have said. <laughs> Fair enough. On the selectman's uh, substitute motion, which is an amendment on page 18-2, those in favor, please raise your hands. Those opposed, raise your hands. The motion, whoops. Those in favor, which essentially the difference is the select. The selectman's motion would call themselves select persons instead of select board members. So if you favor that, uh, in the motion on page 18-2, please raise your hand. All right, those opposed? Yeah, the motion fails. On the advisory committee's motion for the zoning bylaw is what we'll vote on first. This is... Uh, uh, at the bottom of page 18-3, the vote relating only to the zoning bylaw, <clears throat> changing select board to bo uh, selectman, board of selectmen to select board, and selectmen to select board member, et cetera. Uh, those in favor, please raise your hands. Those opposed? Motion carries by a vote of 155 to 2. And on the uh, general bylaws requiring only a majority vote, those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Motion carries by a majority vote. On uh, the selectmen, I, I believe, agree that, uh, all right. So on the, on the, uh, the only motion before you is the motion on page 19-5, which is consistent with the position you've just taken with respect to the uh, uh, labels for the Board of Selectmen. On that resolution, which relates to changing the, uh, <coughs> those terms and, uh, documents and agreements and so forth in the past and in the future. Uh, those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Motion carries. Uh, we're now going to have a motion to adjourn, which I would like to take electronically, because my <laughs> colleagues on the stage believe that they have solved the problem. So is there a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? Second. All right. Now, let's do an electronic, see if an electronic vote works. Cross your fingers, please. <laughs> Curses foiled again. Uh, all those in favor of adjourning until 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Those opposed, motion carries. Town meeting is adjourned until 7 o'clock tomorrow evening. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.